Singapore and Thailand, one of the important success it has achieved is related to regional security stability. ASEAN has successfully eliminated security related suspicions among its member studies. A state. It is the earlier phase. Security stability was the biggest challenge to be managed with the region. Thankfully, after more than five decades, the challenge has changed. Challenges in all its transform, transform format have always been coming and going in the region. One of the major challenges, challenges facing ASEAN today is the issue of human rights and democracy. From empirical experience, we have learned that regional cooperation will only thrive when it is based on the principle of the respect for human rights and democracy. This is because the essence of state presence and cooperation among state is the respect for the safety and well-being of the people who live in them above all else. Dealing with this issue, ASEAN frankly faces a serious institutional dilemma. And that dilemma can be seen when ASEAN had to deal with the crisis in Myanmar, starting from the Rohingya crisis, and then the other political crisis that follow. The Myanmar crisis is indeed a serious task for ASEAN. When hundreds of thousands of Rohingya refugees flocked to a number of countries a few years ago, it was clear that condemnation and requests to stop violence were no longer sufficient. Likewise, when civil and military conflict erupted there, we know exactly that lip service diplomacy proved unable to stop the acts of persecution that occurred in Myanmar. One of the obstacles that has prevented ASEAN from defining a clear and unequivocal role in resolving the crisis in Myanmar is the principle of non-interference <coughs> in the 1967 ASEAN Charter. This principle has made ASEAN member states reluctant to interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, even if they have far reaching implication for the region. Recent crisis, including the South China Sea crisis and the continued escalation of tension between China and the United States have called into question the relevance of this original principle. For example, should the principle of respect for humanity be trumped by the principle of non-intervention? Which should be prioritized? Non-intervention or intervention in humanitarian crisis? In dealing with the dispute with China in South China Sea, we also see that ASEAN has not been effective organization for its member states. states. This suggests that after 50 years, ASEAN indeed need to revisit the relevance of its trademark diplomatic pleasantries, maintaining regional security, Peace and stability cannot be done simply by avoiding diplomatic conflicts. This firm stance in diplomacy is not only needed when it comes to bilateral issues, but also when it comes to multilateral, regional, and international issues, especially 
if the issue is critical and princi principle, such as humanitarian issues and the territorial sovereignty of member states. We want another world. We want another world war as our present and grandparents experienced in World War I and World War II. I hope not. Indeed, for that very reason, our imagination of peace and diplomacy must be rich. My esteemed audiences, after retiring from government affairs almost 10 years ago, I am still involved in a number of activities that I call painting diplomacy. This endeavor has actually started since I was still in government and I am still working on it today. What is painting diplomacy? If we read Winston Churchill's biography, painting is one of the media that can ease political tension. Painting, Churchill said, could help him cope with pressure. That's why I really appreciate who are you come with Batik today. I am also chairman and founder of the Indonesian Batik Foundation. Today, this is also my design. This is my, my Batik of the crab. After his army lost the Battle of Gallipoli, Turkey, in 1915, Churchill was out of politics for a while. He immersed himself in paint boxes and canvas. However, painting did not merely save his sanity. As he later discovered that painting had also forged his leadership, character, and diplomatic skills. As someone who has been involved in politics since my student days, I understand that Churchill meant paintings are not only able to forge diplomacy skills because painting themselves can be used as a tool of diplomacy. Yes, something that cannot be bridged by politics can be bridged by painting. I have experienced and witnessed this many times. The relationship between art and politics is unique. Sometimes I think why the founding fathers of the Republic of Indonesia were able to sit together and greet each other warmly, even though they were separated by a sharp gap in thought, it was because they were all art lovers. Sukarno, Hatta, and Sahrir, for example, were art lovers. <clears throat> in back, in fact, Bung Karno not only loved art, he was an artist himself. Bes besides writing plays, he also painted art made them diplomat flexible diplomacy. I imagine that if all politicians in the world were equally equipped with the skill of thinking and art, the quality of our political life today might be even better. I have painted President Barack Obama, President Xi Jinping, Queen Elizabeth II, Emperor Akito, President Nelson Mandela, Hillary Clinton, Turkish President Abdullah Gül, and many other world figures. These paintings and the time have been used to flag Indonesia political communication and the diplomatic interests, especially to mobilize humanitarian solidarity. So my paintings, I also try to promote some Indonesia rich culture and nat natural scenery. Almost of all of the world figures I painted were wearing batik clothes, which is now listed as one of the world's cultural heritage heritage. In, in addition, I also painted them against the backdrop of Indonesian scenery ranging from the Borobudur temple 
to the beautiful natural scenery of Bali. I turn the painting into tools of diplomacy. It seems that we need to look at this in the future as one of the rich forms of diplomacy to flex political tension. Through painting, I learned to build bridge of friendship. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, coming back to the topic of our seminar today, if politics has caused more conflict and friendship, then we do need another way to rebuild friendship. And art is the medium that is most likely to make it happen. Imagine if Putin could sit at the same table with Biden and not show off the no no number of nuclear weapons they have, but boast about their collection of paintings, we will not have faced significant food price inflation in the last two years. Politics actually has many faces. It is just that our imagination about politics in recent years may be too poor. So we only imagine trade and military wars when we talk about it. It is time for our imagination to be enriched again. And it's not just ASEAN that need this kind of Im imagination, everyone. Thus, good morning and happy seminar. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Actually, I show you Mr. Stephen Chen. I painted also President, Smart President's Sai. So I, I would like to show you maybe after the seminar. So I would like to visit also to Taiwan sometime soon because I know 300,000 of Indonesian workers works in Taiwan. And if when we would like also serve, uh, I mean, for the special orthopedic uh, hospital for our uh, migrant workers there, because right now I almost cannot come today because I have a problem for my, I mean, uh, bone he here. Okay, thank you very much again. Uh, that is some mix, I mean, that uh, what I could say uh, enjoy the seminar. Mr. Arishman, thank you for your invitation. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Dr. Dipo Alam, for an impactful speech. Your Excellency, Ambassador, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, next is welcoming remarks by the Deputy Representative of Taipei Economic and Trade Office in Indonesia. I would like to kindly invite Mr. Steve Chen, Please, the floor is yours. Dr. Tipo from Center of Southeast Asian Studies, Indonesia. Uh, distinguished uh, ambassadors, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Selamat pagi. I'm very happy to represent uh, Taipei Economic and Cultural Office in, in Indonesia, the de facto embassy in the Indonesia of Taiwan to participate in today's event. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the hosting Center of Southeast Asian Studies Indonesia for today's event. We can see from the agenda, uh, the seminar today covers three themes. Firstly, the uh, uh, regional economic in integration. Second is the uh, uh, security issues, and thirdly, the relations between Taiwan and ASEAN. Please allow me to brief you uh, very shortly about Taiwan. Taiwan, we have 23 million people. It's only five hours from uh, by plane from Indonesia. We have daily flights to Indonesia, actually 430 flights a day. In terms of GDP, even though Taiwan is small, the GDP of Taiwan ranks 21st in the world. That is, in ASEAN countries, 
Taiwan is only second to Indonesia in terms of GDP, in terms of the economic power, economic uh, capacity, Taiwan is actually bigger than the other ASEAN countries. Currently in Taiwan, even though Taiwan does not have formal diplomat diplomatic relationship with ASEAN countries, however, we have very close and very substantive relationships. For now, up to 1 million, 1 million ASEAN citizens living in Taiwan. Out of 1 million, 400,000 are Indonesians. They are working, studying in Taiwan. Actually, Indonesia is the second biggest source of foreign workers in Taiwan. They are treated just like our citizens, enjoying the, our national health insurance. Taiwan has been separated with the other side, you know, after Second World War. Now the world attention is turning to the global security issues. The security issues in Europe, precisely Ukraine, and also the other one that just happened two weeks ago, the security issues in the Middle East. So many scholars, many world leaders are also focusing about the potential security issue in Asia, which is Taiwan Strait. Ladies and gentlemen, Taiwan has been facing security issues after Second World War for more than 70 years. We are under the security threat for 70 years. However, Taiwan continue to work with like-minded countries, with the people, people and government partnership. That's why Taiwan is what it is today. I'm very happy that today we have the first opportunity to work with Center of Southeast Asian Studies in Indonesia for this seminar. I believe these issues are all timely issues. And I hope also look forward to the insights from all the these speakers for all the issues. Thank you very much and have a successful seminar. Thank you very much, Mr. Steve Chen, for an impactful speech. Your Excellency, Ambassador, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The first session is Regional Integration in ASEAN Way Forward. And I would like to kindly invite the moderator to lead the session to kindly come up on stage, Dr. Arisman, Executive Director, Center for Southeast ASEAN Studies, Indonesia. Please, Dr. Arisman, the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. Uh, yeah, as we know that ASEAN now developing uh, its agenda for post-2025 for the economic integration due to the current economic landscape as challenges as well. Today, we have uh, three prominent speakers. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Jayan Menon. He is a senior fellow at the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore. The second speaker, we have Dr. Park from ASEAN Development Bank. And then the last one, Dr. Fitra from University of Indonesia. I would like to give an uh, opportunity for Dr. Menon to present. Please, uh, Dr. Menon, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pa Arisman. And uh, uh, let me start by thanking the organizers, uh, CSCAS, for having me back again. Also, the Taiwan representative office. Um, I meet with the Taiwan embassy in Singapore quite often uh, to talk about their CPTPP uh, uh, membership. 
So I'm uh, very keen uh, to see that happen, hopefully soon. I'm just trying to share my screen. I hope you can see it. Please let me know if you can't see it or you can't hear me, of course. But um, uh, I think I have about 20 odd minutes. So let me get started. Um, and uh, very quickly, you can see from my title what my focus is going to be. It is all about using regionalism for globalization, uh, which I think is really the defining characteristic, uh, the unique, almost unique characteristic of ASEAN, which is often, I think, underappreciated. Uh, so that's what I will focus on. But uh, this is an outline. I'll start with some uh, background on um, ASEAN's regional integration processes, focusing in on the 2025 blueprint and uh, how it's going. Uh, and then talk about that special nature of ASEAN and how it might uh, perform in the face of rising uh, short-term risks, including the return of protectionism, and a number of uh, longer-term uh, challenges uh, that it has to face. Is um, ASEAN up to the task? And will it uh, withstand these uh, short-term and longer-term challenges? And then I'll quickly conclude. Right. So I think the first, uh, the best place to start is to think of where ASEAN sits, right? ASEAN, of course, uh, is um, uh, in the middle of um, uh, a lot of uh, other agreements that the members are participating in. Uh, and this is what is often referred to as ASEAN centrality. Uh, you can see that um, in this picture, you know, it's uh, got relations in uh, the broader region through RCEP uh, and the CPTPP, uh, where uh, a number of its members uh, are part of that grouping. Um, and uh, then, of course, it has uh, its relations with the EU. Uh, IPEF is a more recent uh, evolving uh, arrangement which is not a traditional FDA, um, but uh, also there's a host of other um, uh, bilateral and minilateral agreements. Um, so uh, this is the context, I think, within which we need to think about ASEAN and how it uh, relates to the broader region. Right, now uh, let me start off with the AEC now. And you can see that, um, uh, in the 2015 KL declaration, ASEAN announced the establishment of the ASEAN Economic Community on December 31, 2015, but uh, the job was not fully done. Uh, so it recognized that um, it would look towards 2025 uh, for the realization of the AEC. So um, uh, there was still work to be done. And so we had a successor blueprint, the AEC 2025 blueprint, uh, aiming to address many of the remaining gaps. And also it brought in some new elements that have emerged since the 2015 blueprint uh, was originally uh, um, you know lodged um, and this 2025 blueprint uh, aimed to address some of the more difficult areas of reform the low-hanging fruit had already been plucked in the original 2015 blueprint uh, and you know a lot of tariffs had already come down sharply but we had seen an increase in the number of non-tariff barriers and this is where the real challenge lies in the NTPs. Uh, but it also looked to simplify rules of origin and um, accelerate the implementation of a number of trade facilitation measures. Uh, it also looked to implement the 
the ASEAN Trade in Services Agreement, replacing the framework agreement, and uh, also reviewing many of the flexibilities and carve-outs which can threaten uh, the overall value of the agreement. So um, this um, was most of the agenda, but it also um, focused on uh, issues of harmonization and regulatory convergence. Uh, this also is in line with uh, the focus on services, uh, which is really the future growth area of trade uh, for ASEAN, um, increasingly uh, future trade in ASEAN, in fact, around the world, will be in services and intermediate services. That's the future of globalization, in fact. Um, and this focus on harmonizing rules and regulatory convergence is also consistent with the RCEP agenda. Again, I want to emphasize how ASEAN must always think about how its uh, agenda can conforms and complements all the other agreements that it's party to, uh, RCEP especially, and this is uh, critical for it to uh, avoid uh, contradictions or unnecessary overlaps. Right. Uh, there are also lots of measures to support uh, micro, small and medium enterprises and entrepreneurs. And this is all uh, part of the inclusion agenda uh, and also a critical part of uh, uh, participating in global supply chains. Um, trade is increasingly driven by global supply chains and those supply chains are still very much centered on China. And we need to recognize that in the context of the trade war. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit later. But of course, ASEAN has strong relations with uh, uh, Taiwan as well. Um, and I want to, I'll come back to that also. Um, a big concern with ASEAN, of course, uh, for a long time has been implementation. So ASEAN is uh, very good at signing agreements, but some people are concerned that they're not uh, fully implemented. And this is all part of the all, uh, concern about all carrot and no stick. So the ASEAN Economic Community Council, AECC, um, is, an, is accountable for enforcing compliance with uh, the blueprints uh, strategic measures and is tasked uh, with uh, trying to ensure uh, that uh, you know, agreements are actually implemented on the ground and that um, non-compliance is dealt with. ASEAN, of course, has a dispute settlement mechanism, which was revamped, uh, the AEC, but of course it's never been used. Uh, this is uh, not the ASEAN way. Um, and so this is something I think that needs to be uh, improved going forward. ASEAN is trying to do that. And um, now, of course, uh, we also have the ASEAN Vision 2045. Um, and in case the 2025 agenda is not fully met, uh, they are looking further forward. And how is that going? Uh, the, the, we have a few more years only left before we hit 2025. Uh, so ASEAN used to publish its scorecards um, uh, looking at progress towards 2025, 2015, and then 2025, but it's stopped now. Um, and I think it's being revived, uh, but in 20, just before the pandemic hit, because those scorecards weren't being published anymore, um, I did some work with ideas in Malaysia, uh, looking at progress, and this is uh, a summary of that work. You can see that um, for pillars one and three, uh, there's a lot of red uh, that can be seen, and that's the uh, no evidence of compliance. Uh, yeah, this doesn't mean that there's not it's not being implemented, but often it does mean that. 
um, you know, more often than not, it means that there is uh, no uh, the compliance is falling short, uh, partially uh, met uh, compliance is high with the fourth and fifth pillars. And then for full compliance, really there's only the second pillar. So full compliance was falling short in uh, all the other pillars, which is a concern. And I think um, the pandemic has further slowed progress. Uh, not much has been able to have been achieved during those difficult years of lockdown. And so, um, you know, unless a lot happens in the next few couple of years, we are not going to meet all of the targets. But, you know, ASEAN is, uh, uh, the AEC is a work in progress. It's an evolving thing. It's a journey, not a destination. So the important thing is to continue moving towards that destination. Right. And on that theme, let me move to what I said I was going to focus on um, in my talk, which is, um, you know, how ASEAN is different as a regionalism project. Right. Uh, you know, people often look to Europe as the benchmark, uh, but compared to Europe, ASEAN is different in critical ways. It's outward rather than inward looking. It's market rather than government driven and it's institution light rather than heavy, right? We don't have a Brussels. We have a small secretariat in Jakarta, which is, um, you know, uh, been uh, uh, revamped and uh, been strengthened, but still, right? I mean, the whole character of regionalism, the nature of regionalism is very different, right? Um, and these differences reflect ground realities. Uh, the diversity within ASEAN is huge. The level of trust and ambition is also not as high. Uh, and these are not necessarily bad things. These are reflections of reality. And uh, I think ASEAN has been able to harness this different approach to its advantage and its benefit. Um, so there are very different motivations between the groupings. And I think... Uh, ASEAN's real success lies in its ability to use regionalism for globalization. Um, and so this reflects the means versus ends, right? Regionalism is not an end in itself, right? We pursue regionalism because we want to achieve greater welfare for the citizens of the grouping. And in ASEAN's case, uh, because it's a small player, that greater welfare cannot come from within. Uh, it has to come from greater integration with the rest of the world. And ASEAN has succeeded in that sense, um, in my view. Um, so the usual sort of measures that we use to assess regionalism, um, you know, need to reflect this objective. Um, uh, what do I mean by that? You know, very often people look at things like intra-ASEAN trade, intra-ASEAN investment flows, and these are always low. Intra-ASEAN trade has hardly moved uh, over decades. It's increased a little bit, but still it's around 25 odd percent. But that's not a bad thing, right? Uh, in fact, I think it's a sign of its success rather than failure uh, to integrate, right? Um, it's been low because of the rapid growth in overall trade, most of which is extra-regional. Because most of ASEAN trades with countries outside the region, right? And that's um, uh, the nature of uh, small grouping. So, um, you know, it is a sign that it hasn't tried to use those prefer preferential nature of regionalism to look inward, but rather to continue to engage with its uh, partners outside. So open regionalism is what ASEAN has achieved, 
um, and has served as a springboard for wider liberalization. If you look at the uh, margins of preferences, that is the difference between MFN and uh, preferential rates, either CEPT or Artiga rates, the margin of preference for more than 90% of tariff lines is zero. It's the same, right? MFN and uh, ASEAN preferential rates are the same, right? Uh, and in fact, more than 70% of intra-ASEAN trade is conducted at MFN zero, right? And this is great because a trade diversion is minimized and trade creation is maximized, right? So um, I think um, this is how ASEAN has uh, succeeded using regionalism for globalization, and I hope it'll continue. Um, now, the big question, I think, is will ASEAN's long-standing commitment to open regionalism be able to withstand both rising short-term risks and long-term challenges? And this is the last point that I want to turn to uh, before I conclude. So what are some of these short- and medium-term risks? We know that um, there's been an ongoing trade and technology war. This is uh, the so-called US-China great competition. And ASEAN doesn't want to be caught in the middle. Uh, and Taiwan is also, of course, affected by this. Um, and ASEAN is trying not to take sides. Um, but um, ASEAN's supply chains remain China-centered. So even though we have seen, you know, some trade, uh, some investment moving into the region because of this trade war, um, the big concern is that future escalation will disrupt overall supply chains. And that will not be good for ASEAN or China or the US or the world, right? So the important thing is to try and reduce the escalation in the US-China great competition and the spillover on policy uh, policies that disrupt supply chains. That will be the real challenge. And then, of course, now we have not just trade wars, but real wars. Uh, and, you know, uh, if... It wasn't enough with the U.S., with the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now we have the problems uh, uh, with the Middle East uh, and the concern of it spreading. So geopolitical risks are very high, uh, and we are seeing how already this has fueled um, commodity price inflation um, and monetary tightening. So far, there's been no global recession, uh, but we have seen uh, increase in debt levels with debt crisis, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, all around the world uh, looming. But in this broader region, Sri Lanka and Laos are facing a lot of difficulties. And because of all of these risks, we have seen rising protectionism and globalization. Uh, this was there before uh, the pandemic. It's been rising for a while, but it's been fueled by the pandemic uh, and other uh, wars that I mentioned. And uh, now, of course, we have uh, the return of industrial policy, popularity of industrial policy, and changes in the types of protectionism. So we are seeing a shift in restricting outputs to inputs, right? capital, labor, and especially technology. We're seeing a shift from taxes to subsidies. Uh, and this is the huge uh, popularity of industrial policy. In the US, it's the Inflation Reduction Act and the CHIPS Act, but it's also everywhere throughout the region, right? Uh, um, and there's a long trend, long-term trend of a shift from tariff to non-tariff barriers. And that's continuing. And also we see 
a, a shift in the restriction of uh, imports to exports. This is not to say that the restriction of imports has gone away, but uh, we've seen a rise in the uh, in the number of export bans on food and other agricultural products, um, and uh, also on technology through um, you know limiting the sale of uh, you know microchip and other sophisticated technologies to Chinese firms by U.S. companies, and so on. Right? And all of these changes are now presented as values rather than policies. And we need to be wary of this, right? Uh, often they are presented as attempts to increase resilience and sustainability. Sometimes these are genuine. These are genuine attempts to improve resilience and improve sustainability. Uh, I'm not disputing that. A lot of the green transition is critical uh, for the world. Um, but at other times, you have to be careful that it's not dressed up as a new type of protectionism. Uh, and when they're presented as policies, it's very difficult to argue, right? You can't argue, uh, with, sorry, when they're presented as values rather than policies, it's difficult to argue, right? How do you argue about the importance of resilience or sustainability, right? Uh, so this is something to be wary of. Uh, I'm aware of time, so let me now move on quickly to some long-term megatrends that pose challenges. The first is, again, I've mentioned, related, uh, mentioned, uh, referred to this already in uh, related uh, short-term risks, but technical, uh, te technological disruption is a key concern. Uh, it creates both opportunities and challenges. Uh, the digital economy, um, is uh, allowing a lot of uh, uh, inclusive uh, policies to emerge in bringing people, you know, uh, those who've been excluded from the financial system into the banking system and reducing costs and helping MSMEs uh, with trade. But it's also, uh, you know, posing challenges. It, it may raise... Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, inequalities across countries, but it's also increasing the need for labor mobility um, amid rising anti-globalization sentiment. Uh, so it's making this more difficult to do in this climate. Right? And to that is the whole demographic transition taking place. Right? ASEAN is aging, uh, but at different speeds. And we can see that in a number of original ASEAN member countries, uh, they peaked, um, you know, the ratio of working age to total population peaked, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a while ago, uh, and starting from around 2010, and is now falling uh, in the original members. But in the new members, uh, you know, this is still relatively young. They haven't hit their peaks. So these are uh, divergent trends. And so the benefits of increasing labor mobility is further enhanced within the region and also outside the region. You know, we know the uh, rest of uh, East Asia is also aging rapidly. But India is a populous country relatively young uh, you know, workforce. So there are mutual benefits to be had from labor mobility, especially with the digital economy causing automation and displacement at the lower end. And in fact, now shifting to even the higher end with AI and so on. Of course, the existential challenge of our time is climate change. And I'm sure we hear a lot more about this uh, today. Um, and this is something I think that threatens everything um, and uh, the livelihoods of billions of people. And, you know, the developing country for ASEAN, of course, more vulnerable uh, because the, a lot of ASEAN is still very much rural and agriculture dependent despite years of transformation. Uh, and uh, they will bear huge costs of climate change if mitigation and 
uh, energy transition is not increase. And there's also increased risk of health and disasters um, occurring more frequently. Uh, and these are all uh, you know, challenges that need to be met. And all of these uh, mega trends are uh, leading to persistent or rising inequality, both within and between countries. Uh, now, like climate change, they threaten everything that's been built because they put at risk social and political stability, right? Uh, and so, you know, uh, we know that the, the globalization has benefited uh, the members of ASEAN, as I've mentioned, but the benefits of globalization have not been equally shared. Uh, and this has been a concern and it's not an easy issue to address. Um, the attempts to deal with it, to increase the inclusiveness of growth, but this is this remains a major challenge. Right, now uh, in a couple of minutes, let me quickly conclude. Um, I think the AEC, like other agreements, works best when it's first national reforms. And I think, ASEAN has been successful in doing this, um, and it's, uh, you know, hopefully going to continue along this path of uh, using And this has been a weak spot of ASEAN for a long time, right, because of their consensus model um, and other sort of, you know, approaches We get closer to 2025. Um, you know, uh, this the AECC, the, the new body to try and improve implementation, is a positive step. In that characterizes ASEAN cooperation uh, is still going to be an issue, I think, because it might provide a pretext for non-compliance by its members, especially during these difficult times, right? The most difficult time to pursue reforms is when there's a lot of uncertainty and crises loom in the, on the horizon, right? Rising nationalism and protectionism makes it much more difficult to do difficult reforms where the costs are short-term and concentrated and the benefits are long-term and dispersed. So lobbies uh, that have these concentrated costs will push hard against these reforms, and we need to overcome them. Uh, ASEAN is different, as I've argued, uh, and it has mainly different because it's been able to successfully use regionalism to promote globalization. The EU type model is not feasible for ASEAN and it will never be, right? Things like a single currency, a single currency will never be uh, uh, viable for ASEAN uh, and should not ever be pursued. And I think even if Europe can't do it successfully, ASEAN you know, must learn that lesson. So the type of regionalism must be tempered by ground realities. Uh, recognizing the diversity of ASEAN, uh, and I think so far, so good. Uh, but ASEAN and the AEC is not the only game in town, so it must complement uh, uh, the other agreements that its members are party to, uh, the many mega regionals, as well as the uh, huge number of bilateral agreements and you know, now we have a lot of digital agreements, and then of course, IPEF now is, as well. So these need to be all coherently, coherent and consistent and complementary, right? ASEAN doesn't need to tick every box either, right? When, they, when the reforms are being pursued by other agreements. And you know, I think that's a lesson to keep in mind. Uh, but I think the biggest challenge will be you know, uh, for ASEAN is whether its long-standing commitment 
to open regionalism. I want to repeat this challenge that I mentioned earlier, uh, whether this long-standing challenge to open commitment is able to withstand the many rising short-term risks and long-term challenges in a volatile, volatile climate. In the past, ASEAN has been very pragmatic. It has recognized the value of remaining open and outward looking, and I hope that this will happen again. So uh, with that, let me thank you for your attention. Um, and unfortunately, I have to leave soon uh, because I have a flight to catch. But if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to try and answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Menon. Uh, yeah, Dr. Menon has to leave soon because she has to, he has to catch a flight. If from the audience have a question to Dr. Menon, please, maybe if you have a question to Dr. Menon directly before we move to the next speaker. Any question? Okay, at the back, please, the microphone. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Musa Maliki from uh, UPN uh, Veteran Jakarta. A short question. Uh, can you give a idea or opinions about ASEAN Visions uh, 2045? Can you elaborate more? Uh, thank you. That's, that's it. Yeah, please, Dr. Vena. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't know very much about ASEAN 2045. It's a vision statement. So, you know, as you, as you know uh, very well, uh, vision statements are more sort of uh, aspirational. Uh, you know, they look at um, uh, these long-term uh, visionary objectives rather than those practical issues uh, which are contained in blueprints. You know, the blueprint is the mechanism by which you move towards realizing these visions, right? But of course, um, you know, it includes what we would normally expect, things about inclusion, uh, about resilience, about sustainability, right? So uh, ASEAN here is no different from most other, uh, even national country visions, uh, statements, or other regional vision statements uh, you know this is what's called the vision thing right um, but i think the challenge is how you know um, aec 2025 can work towards realizing those visions uh, that vision and when uh, you know um, the deadline hits us and we do realize that once again not everything has been met or realized uh, how do we go forward from here? As I said, I don't think that's a big failing. Um, as the, uh, you know, ASEAN uh, economic community is a journey rather than a destination. I know that might sound a bit cliche, but it's true, right? Uh, the important thing is that we don't lose momentum in difficult times, right? Um, and uh, these are very difficult times. The temptation to look inward uh, is very real and very many countries have succumbed to it. But I think overall, uh, the region uh, is still committed to outward looking and open regionalism. Uh, you know, despite the, you know, the export controls have been increased on food items. Malaysia, I think, recently in its latest budget um, has re removed the export controls on eggs and chickens and the subsidies and reiterated its commitment to uh, free market principles in uh, serving the objectives of food security, which I think was a very positive indicator of the general commitment uh, to realizing uh, the vision uh, of ASEAN, right, of open uh, regionalism. Um, Indonesia, I know, still has some export controls in place um, on food and oil palm and so on, and hopefully these will uh, slowly be removed. Malaysia also, importantly, uh, started looking, uh, removing oil uh, fuel subsidies, right? And this is critical for the vision of, um, you know, uh, a, a climate 
energy-friendly future, right? The energy transition. Uh, the best thing we can do is remove, or first at least reduce the massive fuel subsidies, and these are present in Indonesia as well, because this is discouraging all the other policies that we are trying to put in place for the energy transition. And the huge savings that could be met could be further used to enhance uh, the expensive clean energy transition, right? Uh, but I know this is politically unpopular, but the beneficiaries of fuel subsidies are not the poor, right? Um, and um, even um, if the, uh, the savings are not directed towards the poor, they would still benefit indirectly from lower prices. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so this uh, concern that um, the subsidies will be, a, uh, the removal of these fuel subsidies will be a burden on the poor, the majority is misplaced. Right, so we face a challenge of, um, you know, selling or educating uh, politicians and the public on these types of issues. This is the economic challenge of in getting the idea uh, through that, you know, these fuel subsidies are not benefiting the poor; uh, they're benefiting um, multinational corporations, right, uh, oil producers. And, um, you know, you can actually even compensate them indirectly in other ways uh, if you face that difficult uh, lobby uh, to overcome. Uh, anyway, so, um, yeah, so I think the vision is, uh, you know, the things about inclusion, sustainability and resilience. And the important thing, though, is the me mechanisms. And we need to focus on that. Uh, for the couple more years that we have to 2025 and then uh, beyond to 2045. Let me stop there, Paris. Man. Okay, thank you, Dr. Menon. Uh, now we have to move to the second speaker, Dr. Chin Yong Park, Director of Regional Cooperation and Integration and Threat Division, Asian Development Bank. Dr. Park, are you here? You can share your slide, please. Okay, please, Dr. Park, the time is yours. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Um, I would also like to extend my thanks to the organizers and also welcome uh, participants to this conference. Um, well, today I will um, briefly speak about the uh, progress in ASEAN economic integration and discuss the challenges uh, and opportunities associated with the uh, ASEAN integration. Next slide, please. I'll share briefly the overview and an outlook for ASEAN economies um, and look at closely the ASEAN's trade and participation in GDC, and discuss some trends in macroeconomic convergence and uh, growth drivers, and conclude uh, by uh, discussing some challenges and opportunities. Next slide, please. So, um, are there any economies that have uh, recorded a strong um, GDP growth for uh, many decades? ASEAN economies currently have a combined GDP of about uh, 3.3 trillion. It ranks fifth largest economy globally and the third largest in, uh, in the region. ADB, uh, through its flagship publication uh, in uh, July 2023, projected that ASEAN uh, will recover uh, smoothly from the pandemic uh, with economic growth being 4.6% this year and 4.9% next year. IMF also presented um, a rather longer uh, medium term outlook for ASEAN 5. Uh, as you can see in the table below, 
ASEAN is expected to uh, maintain uh, quite healthy and uh, solid growth um, on, over the next uh, uh, five years. Next slide, please. Over the past uh, uh, nearly five decades since the formation of ASEAN, uh, economic integration uh, with both internal and external partners have spurred ASEAN's rapid growth and economic transformation. Across the board, ASEAN uh, economic member states have uh, now um, moved well into a very uh, stable, strong growth period. And as you can see, um, most economies, uh, with the exception of the COVID time, um, maintain uh, fairly uh, strong and positive growth. Uh, at least um, over the past uh, three decades, um, the uh, once um, the the some of the uh, smaller uh, ASEAN economies that uh, entered ASEAN membership a little uh, later than others also now um, grow quite strongly. Next slide, please. The chart shows the distribution of uh, GDP per capita across 10 ASEAN member states uh, in, uh, um, in those uh, years over uh, the past five decades. And you can see that um, there has been uh, fairly uh, visible uh, economic convergence uh, since uh, 1995. And most of the economies now reporting higher GDP per capita than the median value. Next slide, please. ASEAN's economic um, growth and then, uh, integration have also uh, the growth about uh, quite uh, um, strong economic transformation. You can see uh, from the chart, uh, the uh, ASEAN economies have uh, uh, now uh, report a much smaller uh, share of uh, agriculture, uh, while their industry and services sectors have gained a strong uh, increase uh, in the share of uh, their um, GDP. Now, um, most of the economies uh, since the formation, the, since the en uh, entry into the ASEAN membership, have uh, um, uh, reduced the uh, share of agriculture significantly, uh, nearly like uh, more than half. Most of for most of the economies. Now, the services sector is uh, contributing the majority of uh, GDP, uh, the in the income as well as the jobs. And uh, you can see that the um, manufacturing surge uh, as ASEAN member states have well integrated into the regional production networks with the uh, PRC, the People's Republic of China, the uh, PRC rising as a hub uh, for uh, the region, uh, serving the global uh, value chain uh, since the late 1980s. Next slide, please. So, um, the ASEAN, uh, with the, the from um, the, from this slide up, uh, uh, and the um, the next few uh, slides, uh, we will uh, look into the details of uh, ASEAN's uh, trade and then investment dynamics. Um, open trade and investment policies have uh, been a key driver of uh, ASEAN's economic growth and integration. Um, and uh, this also uh, is a, a kind of like, you know, the, a good uh, illustration of uh, ASEAN's uh, increased participation in uh, global value chains. 
together with the um, uh, the deepening of uh, regional value chain, the foreign direct investment also grew strongly and uh, driving the economic growth and transformation in the region. ASEAN's intra-regional trade linkages have uh, strengthened as uh, the as the region has been successfully integrating its manufacturing sector uh, into the regional production networks uh, with the uh, uh, China uh, as a hub. Next slide, please. So uh, the um, charts here, two charts to show the uh, uh, ASEAN's economic integration uh, in uh, merchandise through merchandise trade and uh, services trade. As you can see uh, that uh, the um, over time, that uh, China has emerged as the region's top trading partner. It accounts for nearly 20% of uh, total ASEAN trade, followed by um, North America and uh, European Union plus uh, United Kingdom. So the uh, uh, in the manufacture the in the merchandise trade uh, chart, you can see that the you know, the visible increase uh, in uh, in the gray shade bar, and that's uh, that's the uh, China, and um, also uh, the strong increase uh, in uh, intra regional trade by the line chart. The region's production sharing contributed to <clears throat> strong intra-regional trade linkages, but uh, its uh, intra-regional uh, share in the total merchandise trade has been uh, rather stable, uh, as you can see, um, uh, around the 20 to 25 percent uh, across uh, the over time, and. Uh, intra like on the services, uh, in fact, um, the uh, intra-regional trade share is much lower than its counterparts uh, in merchandise trade. Uh, but tourism and the other services sectors are gaining economic uh, momentum uh, and, and uh, accounting uh, quite significantly now uh, in, uh, uh, in its uh, GDP for ASEAN. Next slide, please. We can uh, further um, decompose the gross exports into the domestic components and then the foreign components. Um, I'm not gonna uh, bore you with the uh, uh, details of uh, mechanic uh, of uh, calculation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but uh, again, next slide, please. But this uh, um, GVC decomposition actually. Um, also uh, measure the uh, backward participation uh, by the foreign value added and also forward uh, participation by domestic value added. Next slide, please. With this uh, um, the decomposition, uh, uh, we can actually show a more um, detailed uh, picture of uh, structural changes. ASEAN uh, has become one of the most important regional hubs for GVC. It uh, serves as uh, one of the major production hubs in automotive, automotive and electronics. Uh, it also serves as a major hub for electrical and electronics production. Next slide, please. So you can see uh, from uh, the chart on your on the left hand side, the ASEAN's GVC participation is uh, defined by the share of uh, value added contents in gross exports, exports which are uh, exported uh, for um, further processing overseas. So uh, in this panel, you can see that the ASEAN's GVC participation ratio, uh, which has been um, kind of hovering around like 80% uh, between uh, 2000 to 2014. Uh, since then, uh, it gradually declined to 75% in 2019. The region's uh, GVC participation uh, has recovered a little bit uh, during the pandemic period, 
this might be uh, reflecting the bigger fall in the final gets trade as compared to the share uh, trade of uh, intermediate gets. In the panel on your right hand side, um, the gross, the regional value chain participation uh, represents the share of ASEAN's intra regional value chain exports and its gross intra regional exports. Uh, this uh, uh, it excludes all non ASEAN third economies in gross exports. This figure underscores the importance of uh, intermediate trade in the region's intra regional trade. The combined share of uh, simple and complex uh, GVC participation uh, is uh, uh, nearly like uh, three quarters of the region's gross exports. So non GVC exports in ASEAN's intra regional trade is about 25% of ASEAN's uh, gross, gross exports to ASEAN. Um, uh, intuitively, uh, it just shows that, um, you know, the ASEAN's uh, export to ASEAN are driven by the um, trade of intermediate. So they are coming in to ASEAN, but are exported again uh, to other economies in ASEAN uh, for further processing. So, and then, uh, you know, when the um, processing is uh, done, uh, I mean, basically the, when the, uh, these kind of like a trade of intermediate, it's uh, happening uh, cross border, like only once, it's con considered simple. Uh, if it's uh, uh, done uh, uh, two or more times, it's considered complex. And then as you can see, uh, that uh, you know, there's a really um, strong increase in uh, the complex RDC in ASEAN, um, uh, uh, as well as some uh, increase in the uh, final goods export from ASEAN. So next slide, please. Now, um, there's uh, also uh, the role of uh, um, China in ASEAN's GVC participation. The chart shows ASEAN to China um, RBC, the regional value chain participation. Uh, again, driven, uh, again, decomposed into the final goods and then the simple, inter, uh, simple intermediate good and then the more complex intermediate goods trade. And uh, ASEAN's uh, gross export to uh, China uh, seem to be um, dominated by the intermediate inputs, both uh, simple and complex. So the uh, yellow and orange together uh, actually shows that um, a more uh, sim uh, the like more of a trade in intermediate goods, and um, the you can see that the, this uh, um, increase in um, the, Actually, like uh, the, no, the, uh, sorry, this, the yellow and green are uh, the intermediate goods. And as you can see, that the yellow and green uh, together are um, a majority of uh, ASEAN to uh, China exports. And, um, but the, uh, the uh, yellow, the orange actually represents the uh, final goods. Um, export from uh, ASEAN to PRC, and that's increasing. Uh, while um, also the, uh, um, the although they fairly stable, but the um, there's a, um, a, a more significant decline in uh, the intermediate trade for simple processing. And uh, evidence uh, based on these uh, trade patterns, um, the uh, PRC uh, does uh, show a very strong, um, you know, partner for um, for ASEAN, uh, uh, linking the ASEAN's uh, integration uh, into uh, GVC um, participation. Now, uh, next slide, please. Um, we also computed um, the. You know, ASEAN's trade uh, complementarity. Uh, that means, um, you know, like uh, whether or not the ASEAN's uh, um, exports are complementary to each other. And um, this based on the uh, trade complementarity, 
uh, deeper regional trade integration could offer more opportunities to improve ASEAN's economic efficiency, productivity, and competitiveness in uh, global markets. The Trade Complementarity Index uh, measure uh, to what extent the export profile of the reporters matches the um, import uh, profile of the partner. So it's that, uh, like, uh, for example, like you know, where, where uh, you actually measure the uh, uh, the export profile of uh, say Indonesia. And then um, the, you also look at the uh, import profile of uh, um, Singapore, and then see if uh, they are like how how compatible they are, how like, you know how sort of like a one-on-one -on -one, uh, matching can be made. And this uh, so the um, the formula uh, to measure this index is uh, provided there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we can see that um, there. Um, this uh, trade complementarity index uh, for ASEAN in um, 2013 and 2021. And as you can see, um, there are uh, like many more like uh, these uh, pair um, that shows the high complementarity. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the charts is um, um, is actually now like um, kind of illustrated uh, into three different um, degrees of the complementarity. The low complementarity uh, is the uh, trade complementarity index uh, of uh, below uh, 0.3. And then the medium is uh, between uh, 0.3 and 0.5. And then high complementarity shows the uh, trade complementarity index uh, uh, rising above uh, 0.5. And in 2013, um, the, uh, you can see that the you know, kind of like a Malaysia uh, and uh, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand uh, show uh, relatively uh, high trade complementarity with uh, uh, of the, with the um, ASEAN partners um, like you know Indonesia, Malaysia, and then Philippines, Singapore, like this. And 2021, um, you can see uh, nearly half of uh, the ASEAN uh, export import partners uh, the show a higher uh, trade complementarity index. So, uh, so we witness a substantial increase in ASEAN's trade complementarity index between um, 2013 and 2021. Um, this. Uh, um, Kind of uh, um, this kind of shows that uh, potential gain from further trade integration um, across ASEAN uh, economies. In uh, 2013, um, altogether there were about like you know uh, uh, 44 pairs with low complementarity, while only nine shows a high complementarity. But uh, in 2021. 27 pairs show uh, low complementarity, while um, now 29 uh, showing high complementarity. So uh, based on this uh, trade complementarity index, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand uh, seem to have a high to medium trade complementarity with all ASEAN trading partners in 2013. Uh, now, uh, in 2021, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam uh, have uh, medium to high trade complementarity with uh, uh, nearly all ASEAN economies. Overall, um, this uh, uh, greater trade complementarity uh, suggests that potentially large economic gains from uh, trading uh, more um, across ASEAN economies, um, which will offer better resource uh, allocation opportunities and uh, more efficient financial flows and also um, greater economic gains. Next slide, please. So there seem to be um, greater economic gains coming from um, economic uh, convergence. Um, so well, I uh, use the um, model uh, that um, try to 
uh, test hypothesis, uh, whether or not the ASEAN membership can contribute to the member states' uh, uh, ascension to a higher income group uh, after, uh, uh, um, after 10 years uh, lag. Um, and uh, we regress this uh, growth the drivers um, and time varying structural characteristics in the model uh, below. Um, uh, are you okay? And uh, this model, the binary dependent uh, variable, the uh, M, uh, is the uh, ASEAN uh, membership. Uh, so it takes the value of one if the economy belongs to the um, uh, upper uh, threshold value and uh, zero otherwise. So basically, like you know, the, depending on these um, the growth drivers and then time varying structural characteristics, whether or not the um, these uh, these variables contribute uh, to ASEAN economies the moving um, uh, you know moving into a higher income group. Uh, for uh, this model, we use the uh, load transform uh, GDP per capita uh, to. Uh, classify the estimated 20% um, percentile, like so the top 20% as a uh, high income group. So if uh, the, any of the ASEAN uh, economy actually moves into this uh, top 20%, the higher income group, uh, then uh, it will take the, uh, it will take a value one. Uh, if uh, it doesn't, then uh, it takes the value uh, zero. So using the distributional approach, we will identify a cutoff uh, value, uh, and, uh, this uh, um, value one uh, for high income group. And uh, we include the uh, uh, binary uh, variable, uh, um, like we use actually the uh, ASEAN membership as a binary uh, variable. So next slide, please. The, uh, table um, just uh, gives you a list of the variables and the data sources. Okay. And then um, the next slide, please. Uh, here, um, I present the uh, empirical results um, for ASEAN economies. And then uh, what's uh, interesting is actually the um, the uh, you know, significance of uh, ASEAN membership. Um, the ASEAN membership uh, is uh, positive and significant, the effect of ASEAN membership uh, in uh, you know, pushing an ASEAN uh, member state into a high income group is actually positive and significant. Uh, when uh, the membership is, uh, expand, ex uh, is expanded to uh, include ASEAN plus three, uh, the coefficient is uh, even greater. And uh, as expected, um, the, uh, you know, major growth drivers, uh, such as um, uh, physical capital growth, uh, human, uh, the, the civil liberties, uh, excess savings, and then the oil share uh, as a representative for the uh, natural resources, um, you know, all actually come out fairly significant. As you can see that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, um, again, uh, in, summarize, in summary, the using the ASEAN as a dummy variable, like we find that uh, being an ASEAN member significantly contributed to 0.3% um, increase in the uh, likelihood of, uh, you know, ASEAN member states moving to a higher income group. Uh, similarly, 1% um, increase in the physical capital growth, so the investment, uh, basically investment growth, uh, and the savings investment gap raises the likelihood of reaching the higher income group by roughly um, 0.03% uh, and 0.05% respectively. Civil uh, liberty index uh, is, uh, uh, take, is uh, uh, our choice variable to uh, uh, proxies uh, the quality institution. It is uh, also a significant driver of uh, their member state uh, for uh, moving on to a higher income uh, bracket. And uh, uh, as them, uh, the similar results all apply like uh, for uh, ASEAN plus three, uh, just uh, uh, the coefficient for ASEAN plus three membership 
is uh, significantly higher uh, or else constant. And uh, we uh, generally see um, the insignificant effect of the productivity, human capital growth for uh, both scenarios. Next slide, please. So, can you move uh, one slide back? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, the long term growth prospects for ASEAN economies uh, seem to be uh, generally positive, uh, but uh, the region uh, faces significant challenges uh, due to demographic changes, disparities in uh, socioeconomic development, uneven digitalization, um, growing uh, geopolitical tensions, and risks from climate change. Uh, the uh, region has uh, set its sights on uh, developing into a uh, thriving and linked economic community uh, through the establishment of uh, uh, AEC. However, it must uh, confront major is issues such as the large um, socioeconomic development gaps within and across border, and needs to seize uh, new opportunities to realize uh, uh, the AEC's vision of a single market and then production base. Uh, this would require um, increased uh, in infrastructure investment, uh, digital um, digitalization, the, uh, move, uh, transition to a digital economy, lower trade barriers, improve labor mobility, and uh, foreign uh, direct investment as uh, um, essential elements um, for uh, pushing the ASEAN uh, towards a more integrated and uh, also uh, affluent uh, economic community. Uh, there's a, there is a stronger effort uh, to close the development gap and enforce the ASEAN commitment among member states. Uh, for example, uh, Singapore has the uh, highest per capita income in ASEAN uh, uh, at uh, 55,000 uh, US dollars. Um, this is uh, uh, more than 50 uh, uh, times higher than that of uh, Cambodia at uh, $1,000. Uh, realizing uh, AEC's commitment uh, becomes a really um, priority uh, by um, you know, the pro the progressing uh, beyond the political solidarity and establishing a more integrated economic community. Stronger regional coordination uh, will be needed to facilitate the um, AEC process and oversee the progress of uh, regional uh, initiatives. Um, digitalization uh, can play an important role in enabling greater investment in infrastructure. ASEAN uh, has embarked on a long-term structural transformation through regional initiatives. Uh, this aimed at uh, integrating and adopting Industry 4.0 in creating elements uh, which are critical in the uh, region's uh, vision of uh, being a digital economy and a digital society. Um, some of the uh, steps uh, that are specified in this uh, Industry 4.0 uh, include the e-government and digital value chains. Uh, and uh, micro, small, and the medium-sized enterprises and startups and uh, smart cities. Uh, to enhance uh, the regional integration, uh, more progress uh, will be required uh, to reduce uh, non-tariff barriers, further liberalizing services trade, and then harmonizing standards and regulations, especially for uh, digital uh, economy and uh, e-commerce. Despite the efforts, uh, trade in services uh, in ASEAN economies um, uh, much less, uh, um, um, I mean, it actually is much less as, a, as uh, I have uh, shared earlier in the chart. Uh, it uh, faces 60% uh, more uh, res uh, res restrictions, trade restrictions um, than uh, global average, according to the services trade restrictions index. And uh, it still uh, shows the large variations across the region. And next slide, please. 
On trade and trade facilitation fronts, a significant progress has been made. The ASEAN Trade Facilitation Framework consolidates the elements of existing uh, trade um, facilitation initiatives in ASEAN. Um, and uh, it focuses on the effective implementation of uh, ASEAN uh, commitments and uh, uh, in instruments related to ASEAN facilitation while uh, providing a coordinated, renewed impetus toward a trade facilitation evolution. A more flexible labor market is essential for optimizing uh, AEC production networks. So far, uh, mutual recognition agreements have been reached for only uh, eight professional qualifications. Um, and um, but uh, the domestic uh, rules and then uh, the regulations on employment and the licensing uh, continue to um, pose uh, large Um, there are, uh, uh, you know, the, well, although there are like uh, potential benefits, the uh, national sensitivities concerning the uh, foreign uh, uh, workers that kept the progress understandably uh, slow. And uh, continued policy efforts to promote FDI uh, is crucial for uh, facilitating international trade and industrial upscaling uh, within Asia, uh, especially um, the you know, targeted reforms and then uh, reliable uh, infrastructure uh, should help the region's latecomers into um, the GVCs. Uh, and uh, especially, uh, we need to support the um, uh, participation of uh, small, um, medium uh, enterprises, small, uh, medium sized enterprises into GVC. Uh, again, uh, last but not least, uh, there are uh, more than 70 million uh, MSMEs in ASEAN, uh, which is uh, significant contributors to the region's growth and then development uh, employment. It uh, comprises uh, you know, nearly, uh, you know, nearly 90, 98, 99% of uh, total uh, business establishments in ASEAN member states and 85% uh, to uh, employment. Uh, we need to um, the, we need to uh, foster these uh, real sectors and uh, real uh, players uh, along the journey to a prosperous uh, AEC. Uh, let me stop here. Uh, I'm happy to uh, entertain any questions if you have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Park, for impression, impressive presentation. Now we move to the last one, Dr. Al Dr. Fitra from Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Indonesia. Please, Dr. Fitra, the time is in. Yeah, you can use Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, Dr. Arisman, and all the participants. So I need to stand here because I need to see my slide. Uh, okay, now, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So how, uh, how we are going to move forward, regionalism in ASEAN. So let me start with a bit of a story. Next, please. No, no, no. Before, for long, okay. A bit of a story in 2011, I was in a meeting in World Bank Tokyo. Uh, I was also being part in ADB Institute at that time. And we were having a conference with the late Surin Pitsuwan, a former uh, general secretary in Asia. So at that time, Surin Pitsuwan proposed and explain to us um, ASEAN in terms of several economic indicators, one of which that I remember the most is the target of having um, 25 or minimum 30% of intra-regional trade share in 2015 as um, indicator of ASEAN economic community. But fast forward, now we are here, in 2023, is still ranging on 24 and 25%. It's not even existing. So, um, in last meeting in ASEAN, ASEAN Summit, we also have some agreement. Uh, we have three major issues, three pillars. One is how do we recover from the pandemic? 
and the second about the digital economy and the third about sustainable economy. One part of digital economy that was uh, being a commitment for ASEAN, digital economic framework, yeah, uh, as a consensus for ASEAN member countries. But I think this is also be, you know, just as a commitment without a realization. Because ASEAN alone is going nowhere. So if we can see the next slide. Next, please. Okay. So ASEAN is destined not to be alone, but to serve other region. ASEAN is a global hub, a regional, regional and also a global hub. So all entangled together. In Hinduism, we know um, the wife of Pandawa, Drupadi. Drupadi is the wife of five Pandawa, the wife of five noble warriors. Drupadi, mm -hmm. the wife, controlling all of his husbands, noble warrior, the god themselves. Drupadi controlling, is controlling the god. ASEAN should be the Drupadi of this region. Because, of course, we are not in power, we are not that good, we are not that rich, but all love ASEAN, Drupadi. Five Pandavas love Drupadi. So one wife, five husband. ASEAN can also serve like that. Because if we can see ASEAN, the intra-regional trade share is 25%. But if you include, for example, China, Japan, and Korea, 60 to 70%. If you include the RSEC, is even greater. So it is destined to be Drupadi. It is destined to be the place to meet. So it's not ASEAN alone, but because ASEAN alone is going nowhere. Next. So if you can see, yeah, all of the mega RTAs all should and can and could include ASEAN because ASEAN is the center. ASEAN is the epicenter of growth. Um, of course, we are having troubles of, of, of non-tariff barriers, but it's negotiable in the terms of ASEAN way. We have the so-called ASEAN way. It's actually, actually a bit abstract, but it is actually the foundation that can actually become a hub of other region, other countries. Next. They say that this is the Asian century. The West, sorry for saying this, for mm -hmm. saying this, the West is not the future. Asia is the future. Because if you see it from the total world output by 2030, it's more than one third of total world output coming from only emerging Asia. Not to mention ASEAN and other, other part of Asian countries. So we are most likely, Asia is most likely dominating the world. Of course, we have the trend of deglobalization coming from the West. Of course, because sorry to say, the West is losing the game. But Asian countries should be not to be, you know, reluctant to have a global integration. Stiglitz once said that, okay, this is the period, post-pandemic is the period of deglobalization. But Asian countries should steer the way towards a more integrated region because globalization is the answer of efficiency and resiliency. You cannot actually move away from globalization. It is backward. We need to spur growth, engage together, collaborate, of course, we have competition here and there, but the thing is we need to collaborate even more because this, is, this will be beneficial not only for Asian countries, but also for, for the Western. Next, please. If we see the global tensions, the French shoring, the West moving away from the so-called yeah, Russian entities, even China is deemed to be too close with Russia, okay? So the trade and investment activities moving away from that part, 
China and also some other friends also moving away from the West, but ASEAN, we can go here and there. Because all friends of ASEAN, Drupadi, everyone loves Drupadi. So to make a better world, we need to be having this lowest common denominator. And the one and the place to meet is ASEAN. ASEAN can be there, ASEAN can be here, ASEAN can engage with all parts of the region. We don't have enemies. Of course we have, of course, conflicts, Myanmar conflicts, but ASEAN since 1967 is already here, is already actually become a solid entity in terms of political consolidations, but none is having in terms of economic integration. Mm -hmm. That is why ASEAN, ASEAN doesn't have the money to build the infrastructure. So this is a bit of mutual relation, mutualism. We need you and you need us. This is the future. Next. So I might want to refer to one of my book, Trade Strategy in East Asia, From Regionalization to Regionalism. Next. So a bit of um, you know, a, a brief definition of regionalism, regionalism versus regionalization. So I argue that we need to be beyond regionalization because regionalization is only market driven. We need to be more institutionalized so that we can grow together. Sustainability is coming from institutionalization. ASEAN, okay, ASEAN Secretariat is yeah, just a you know small place in Jakarta. But we can go beyond that. Yeah. One of the most possible and best practices, of course, the EU in terms of institutionalization. But to the other perspective, since ASEAN is also offering you soft and open regionalism, so Drupadi, so EU is having a marriage, a fixed marriage, you cannot have more than one husband. ASEAN can have it. It's okay to have relations with Vietnam, having a relationship with, for example, the US, bilateral trade negotiations. Okay, we don't mind. As long as it can be in the future beneficial for the whole ASEAN, which is actually, empirically speaking, is justified. We can have this bilateral trade and investment negotiation all the way. It's not like the EU. EU is strict. Maybe it's just like a Catholic marriage, right? So you cannot get a divorce. Yeah, <laughs> if you want to get a divorce, it's so hard. You need to call the Pope and the Pope is having all kinds of jobs and your marriage is just the least thing to do. We can see it from Brexit. UK trying to get out from Brexit, uh, from the uh, from, from EU is, is so hard. But we don't mm -hmm. have that kind of an issue. It's not even in our mind that we not we need to break up from ASEAN because all is fine. We can go there, we can go here, we can go bilateral, we can go have having more than one wife, one husband, it's okay, because we are pleased to meet. Regionalization, moving forward to regionalism. Next. Okay, um, so just a bit of technical part. In my simulation, my simulation suggests that it is actually ju it's a justification of institutionalization. When we have mm -hmm. FDA, trade and investment cooperation, it will give you a net welfare gain bigger and more sustainable for not only for ASEAN region, but for all the counterparties. Next. And one of the most possible way to do it to engage it is through production network. Intra-industry trade is one of which. So this is, in my book, I uh, try to simulate um, China, Japan, and Korea. In terms of the total trade, China, Japan, and Korea, we have uh, you know different relation with ASEAN. China is more um, 
horizontal while uh, uh, Korea and Japan is more vertical. So it's, it's justified because in terms of uh, horizontal relation means the same quality in stage of production. Vertical means different quality, which is actually, yeah, we, we compare with Japan and Korea is already developed. But if you disaggregate the number, next, if you disaggregate the number to parts and components, next, please. Next. Next. Now, okay, this is the parts and components. All, even China, have actually vertical intra industry trade, which is now, if I want to interpret this, China is moving to higher stage of production, meaning that in terms of Chinese global production network, the ASEAN can actually follow suit. ASEAN can engage more with uh, China because China is now moving to the upper stage of production. So the middle low is ASEAN. So the maybe the question is, oh, in that case, ASEAN will be always middle low. Not exactly. Because if we see the case of China, they once were part of the Japanese production network from the Akamatsu Flying Geese model, we see that China, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan are sub-tiers of Japanese production network. But we can see now China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, South Korea have their own production network, the established production network. They're moving for the stage of production. So ASEAN can be also like that if we can actually have the spillover effect, which is justified by this empirical studies. Next. Okay, but in the likes of, you know, payoff metrics, China cannot do this alone with ASEAN. China cannot dominate ASEAN. Why? Because if China alone is going here alone and dominating, this will crowd out any potential investors. Mm. And it's justified qualitatively also. Quantitatively speaking, the net welfare gain by China is only the single entity and ASEAN will give you negative mm. welfare gain because of the shallow discussion, shallow proposal, shallow FDAs. We can see it in the lives of um, high-speed train. Series of discussion, time overrun, cost overrun. Typical Chinese investment. Net welfare gain will be negative. So we need a balancing structure, not only China. China is okay. We need to also be with the giant. But if the giant is only the one and only dominating ASEAN, this won't be good for the future of ASEAN. We need more than a single giant, more than one husband. Drupadi, I have five Pandavas. Not only Yudhisthira, but also Krishna, Bhima, five, not one. Next. So, as the behavior strategy, does Japan also follow here in my simulation suggests that Oh, okay, China is entering ASEAN. Maybe um, I can also enter ASEAN, but the problem arises, as just I mentioned earlier, that a potential crowding out will be established. So Japan, China, South Korea, or maybe other countries, maybe we have here, Taiwan, Malaysia, Ukraine, uh, all of the EU, EU countries will be quite reluctant to enter because China is quite dominant. Next. So how we can actually ensure that ASEAN can grow together? Next, next. Okay, um, for, uh, for the perspective of Indonesia, as an Indonesian, I'm saying that we are very unfortunate not reaping and not utilizing the great power of the Chinese and also the uh, East Asian production network. We are lagging behind Indonesia. If I also add Vietnam there, Vietnam is also ahead. So Indonesia is just becoming a market, not a base 
of production. A market, a big market, yes. But we don't have any, you know, capabilities in utilize, utilizing or participating, but participating in uh, 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 the great power of production network. Next. So how we can utilize that? Yeah, of course, we need to be more open, not banning. We ban. Indonesia is like to ban and over-regulate things. That is not the way. We need, so sometimes you also close the economy, no imports. That is also bad. Opening up. And we also need to increase the capacity of the labor. Not necessarily that we have, we have, you know, yeah, labor as a labor abundant country, yeah, we have low quality labor. So how to resolve that? We're engaging more with the production network because mm -hmm. we have this so-called spillover effect. It is empirically justified. Opening up, not closing the gate. Next. Okay, because we have the serious problem of next. Deindustrialization. Next, next. Deindustrialization. Professor Park suggests earlier about the structural transformation, the agricultural to the manufacturing and the services. Mm. But now, you know what? In Indonesia, the contribution of the manufacturing sector to the GDP is only 19, 18 to 19%. In the early 2000, we have 29%. So, deindustrialization. According to Roderick, this is a premature deindustrialization. If you are premature, you need to be you know, treated as a premature baby. You cannot be, you know, in outside world because you're still premature. We need a special treatment in order to have to, to have the good, healthy baby. So how we do that? Again, industrialization downstreaming strategy, increasing human capacity, utilizing the technology. That is the way to do it. We need to embrace more with the investment, not to ban, not to constrain the investment, opening up because we need also the money, ASEAN, in terms of ASEAN, we need also the money, we need the infrastructure, you need us also to be relevant, to stay relevant. But ASEAN also needs the money for the future. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fitra. I think uh, I only give one opportunity due to the limit of time. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Park and Dr. Fitra, please. Oh, yeah. Prof. Raldi. Thank you very much. I'm Raldi Kustur from Indonesia and from CIS. CIS, CIS, CIS. I uh, appreciate so much about the presentation for both uh, Dr. Park and uh, Dr. Fitra. But uh, you don't mention any about the sub-economic regions. Basically, in ASEAN, there are three sub-economic regions. The first one is IMTGT, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Growth Area, and Triangle. The second one is the IMP, Eaga. The third one is uh, Greater Mekong sub-region. And in term, uh, in connection with ADB, I just wondering whether you know that uh, the positions of the three, you put priority on GMS. Is there any particular reasons? That's my questions goes to Park. For Drupadi, I like your style, but the thing about uh, thinking about the three uh, sub economic regions, which one you prefer? The, the, the both two, two among the ASEAN or the other part, there is GMS, GMS. Because in GMS, there is a PRC. So it's going to be very, uh, I would say, it's absurd if we help so much about the GMS. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Raldi. Dr. Park, you want to... Dr. Park, still here? Dr. Park? <laughs> or maybe Dr. Fitra first to respond. Okay, uh, thank you. 
So, I have a story about um, not specifically in sub regional, but yeah, yeah, more or less the same. Yeah, because it's about the relation between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand in terms of ITRO, International uh, Tripartite Rubber Organization. Once we try to mimic EU. EU once settled from European coal and steel company, right? The economic interest. We also had that before in terms of international tripartite rubber organization. But in reality, everyone is actually trying to, you know, cheat to each other in terms of setting the quotas and so the Kurno, technically speaking, the Kurno Nash equilibrium is not there. So in reality, cheating all the way, so the outcome is not that positive. Okay. In terms of sub-regional, I think um, my uh, some of my research suggests that the more it's the mer merrier, the more, the more you have you know, entangled with other regions, the merrier, the better, right? So in the likes of that, so I think I cannot choose because yeah, if you can actually becoming a hub, yeah, so you can be, you know, plugged into this region and plugged into this region and subnationally speaking is also plugging and so on and so forth. But the truth is if ASEAN alone is going nowhere, so, so does the subnational. So I don't so, so sub region. So I don't think that um, sub region, sub national, uh, be it the IMT GT or BIM EAGA, will trump ASEAN. No, but yeah, if we can also bring extra power, yeah, to you know, to to bring yeah the investment and so on and so forth. So I think that's become more powerful. Thank you, Dr. Fitra. Looks like Dr. Pak uh, lost connection. Uh, so I don't uh, want to. Paris talk man. Oh. Paris man. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm just at the airport now. Maybe uh, if you can hear me, maybe I'll just. Oh, yeah, please, Dr. Menon. If you yeah. have any okay. comment on this. Yes. Sure. I think, uh, well, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, I think uh, I was in ABB for 21 years, so let me just share uh, my perspective on the sub-regional um, uh, question. Um, it's true that the GMS is the flagship uh, sub-regional project of the ABB, and um, uh, but the ABB does support uh, the other sub-regional groupings as well, IMTGT and Vintiaga. These are important to ABB. Okay, that's the approach uh, that's being taken. Uh, sub-regionalism, um, but uh, of course the members of the GMS um, have a very difficult history and have the lowest level of uh, economic development um, in ASEAN. And so there is that focus, uh, I think, to try and lift them up uh, as also the newest and least developed countries of ASEAN and the need to actually create peace. Uh, and I think that is the real dividend that we haven't spoken much about today, the peace dividend from regionalism. Without peace, you cannot have economic progress. And this was a region that suffered greatly in the past uh, from uh, conflict in the region, uh, the aftermath of the Vietnam War. But now we can see how they have prospered uh, through peace. And of course, uh, the huge uh, improvement in productivity that's come through infrastructure investment uh, that ADB and other multilateral agencies have contributed to. Uh, IMTGT and uh, BPEGA deal with the poorest sub-regions within uh, developing countries, and that's also very challenging. But there, I think the national governments also need to play a bigger role, and they cannot abrogate their responsibility by turning it over to uh, sub-regional uh, programs uh, that are managed by multilateral agencies. I think the national government must be also proactive in helping them lift their sub-regions up further. Uh, but that's my take on why the focus has been more on GMS and the other groupings. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Menon. Ya, yeah, uh, again, uh, we are very <laughs> limit of time. So, uh, yeah, of course, if we, ASEAN would like to be epicentrum of growth, uh, so many homework to do, uh, like mentioned by our distinguished speakers. Uh, the challenge is there, there's also opportunity. So I don't want to conclude again. Uh, pick, uh, please give a big applause to all our distinguished speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Arisman, for very delightful discussion. Your Excellency, Ambassador, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue with the second session, ASEAN and Taiwan Future Relation. I would now like uh, to invite the moderator to kindly come up on stage, Dr. Broto Wardoyo, Faculty of Social and Political Science, University of Indonesia. Dr. Broto Wardoyo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, the Master of Ceremony. Uh, good morning, all. My name is Broto. I am one of the faculty members of the Department of International Relations, Universitas Indonesia, and I will be your moderator for the second session. So uh, in the first session, we discuss about the economic integration of ASEAN in the future. Now we will talk about the future relation of ASEAN and Taiwan. And I have the honor to host three excellent speakers. The first one is Professor Alan Haoyang from National Chengchi University. And then the second one is uh, Dr. Emilia Justin Ningrum from National Research and Innovation Agency, or known as BRIN in Bahasa. And the third speaker is Ms. Rateh Kabinawa from University of Western Australia. So, Ibu Emil, if you don't mind, please be with me in here. Uh, because we start a little bit late and I don't want to uh, hold you from lunch, so I will try to finish the session on time. So, for all speakers, uh, I hope you can talk within 10 to 15 minutes. And because uh, Professor Yang will leave us early, so I will give the floor to Professor Yang to deliver your talk and then uh, followed by a question and answer if you still have time. So Professor Yang, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Uh, Park Broto for your uh, kind uh, in, uh, introduction. I know uh, the schedule is a bit delayed, so please allow me to share my presentation uh, briefly. My name is Ellen Yang. I'm currently uh, serving as the professor of Southeast Asian Study at the National Zhengzi University. And I'm also working as the CEO for <clears throat> the policy think tank for the new Southbound policy, the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation based in Taipei. I took the pleasure and honor to take part in this uh, very meaningful uh, event, but it's a pity that I cannot uh, participate in person to interact with our distinguished guests and friends. So probably next time I will try my best to, to make it to attend uh, this uh, meaningful engagement. The section, the previous section uh, was enlightened, enlightened by the distinguished speakers on the latest uh, progress of ASEAN and the Southeast Asian development. And as mentioned earlier by our moderate, Park Proto, this session will touch upon uh, the ASEAN and Taiwan's relationship and uh, also will uh, enlighten uh, with the future blueprint and roadmap. Uh, my quick brief, my quick uh, introduction and the echo to this main theme of this session will be 
prioritizing Taiwan and ASEAN partnership. And I will focus on the new Southbound policy and also its next step. I know uh, the time is quite uh, limited uh, since I have another application to attend and to chair the meeting later. So I will quickly uh, brief you the key takes away of my presentation. I usually uh, uh, introduce the concluding remark first so that you can be aware of what I will be presenting. Uh, I've prepared five uh, uh, key takes away. The first one is Taiwan has been self proven as an important and reliable partner to all Southeast Asia country uh, at the bilateral uh, channel for the past decades and especially in particular since 2016 when President Tsai Ing-wen took office, she not only advocated but uh, with commitment to uh, forge the new Southbound policy that is the people-centered engagement with our ASEAN counterpart and that enhanced our relationship and multifaceted partnership with uh, our friend in Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, point number two, Taiwan has been contributing to the regional and the national resilience, including the social resilience as well as the economic resilience of ASEAN and its member through the new Southbound policy and what we call the warm power practice, especially even during the COVID-19 pandemic. And point number three is, uh, since the NSP play a very important role in facilitating the bilateral, bidirectional cooperation between Taiwan and ASEAN country, the new Southbound policy will definitely continue to facilitate Taiwan's multifaceted partnership with ASEAN community and its people in navigating the journey of the post-pandemic uh, revitalization. We know that uh, since 2020, the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework has been the priority issue of the ASEAN cooperation. So we here in Taiwan, we work very hard to navigate uh, the journey of the post-pandemic, not only the recovery, but also revitalizing effort with our ASEAN counterpart. And number four, the prospect of new Southbound policy will still prioritize Taiwan's collaboration with Southeast Asia, while no going back track to the China priority strategies. And lastly, but not the least, together we can make differences. And this is the uh, new Southbound policy uh, 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 geographical setting that this is the first ever Asian policy, the regional strategy for Asia of Taiwan comparing with the previous wave of the regional approach. And this policy covers 18 country, partner country in Indo-Pacific region, uh, mostly uh, are based in Southeast Asia and including uh, uh, six priority countries such as uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and Thailand. And the other th three uh, priority country in, in India, Australia, and New Zealand. So these eight pr priority country out of the 18 partner country of South of the new Southbound policy that during the past seven to eight years under President Tsai Ing-wen's leadership, um, Many projects has been successfully have been successfully implemented, and also the uh, the contribution to the uh, regional community building process, as well as the even during the pandemic, Taiwan uh, highlight uh, the importance of uh, Taiwan can help Asia and Asia can help Taiwan. As mentioned by President Tsai Ing-wen, she uh, articulated again and again, the new Southbound policy is at the core of Taiwan's own Indo-Pacific strategy. And in 2017, she also advocated that new Southbound policy is Taiwan's regional strategy for Asia. And until today, 
this policy still play a very important role in Taiwan's relationship with our neighbors, especially different stakeholders. And President Tsai and her administration uh, committed in promoting this policy through a cross-sectoral uh, partnership, including four different P. The first P is public sector, the government. The second P is private sector. The third P is the civil society and the people sector, that is the NGO. And with this four, these three uh, P, uh, the joint effort has been made uh, by Taiwanese stakeholders and our counterpart in this region. After seven years uh, uh, implementation, definitely uh, this policy has gone somewhere and achieved the, uh, the progress with our uh, partner uh, stakeholder. And the government-led flagship program include uh, the economic and industrial link, uh, which our uh, previous sessions distinguished speaker addressed on the importance of ASEAN economic community. And also uh, the uh, current situation under the U.S.-China rivalry, uh, Taiwan become a very important option of the cooperation, of the alternative of the cooperation choices. And during the past years, we uh, promote the institutional tie with different uh, partner countries in ASEAN and also in India for the bilateral investment agreement and also to institutionalize the industrial and economic engagement. The second uh, flagship program is on the uh, human resources, such as the education and talent cultivation, including our previous uh, speaker mentioned the human capacity building program. And with that, uh, Taiwanese uh, university and government provide a scholarship and internship to uh, young talents and students from the region. And also we do encourage our students and young talents to study abroad in Southeast Asia, and also to take the internship in the business enterprise and also the NGO in the region, so that the bidirectional exchange can be uh, fully promoted. The third important uh, flagship program is on regional agriculture, especially in the case of Indonesia. Taiwan, is, uh, Taiwan uh, jointly established the comprehensive demonstration agricultural farm in the uh, Kalawan province near Jakarta, jointly to upgrade the capacity of the rural community and also to provide uh, uh, training program for the local farmers and related uh, stakeholders. Apart from this uh, project in Jakarta, uh, Taiwan also worked with uh, Vietnam in uh, in the south part of Vietnam for the demonstration uh, agricultural zone. And also another case is in the Philippines in Bigel province for the mushroom uh, um, demo uh, farm. The fourth one is also very important, which attract international attention. That is the International Medical and Public Health Corporation. With that, since 2018, Taiwan promoted the One Country, One Center program to set up the new Southman Policy Medical Center and Healthcare Center in seven Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia. And so far, with the success of this joint endeavor, uh, this 1C, 1C program has been uh, edible, had, has been up, upgrading to the one country multiple uh, center program. And with that, we provide a training program for the medical doctors and medical nurses. There have been already 1,300 staff, medical staff has been involved in this training program. And they become the important interface to bridge Taiwan's Medical facility, uh, medic, medi health, medical health, healthcare, uh, uh, program, and also the services to uh, Southeast Asian uh, people, and with their uh, with their contribution, uh, Taiwan's uh, 
uh, resources and also the contribution can reach out to different corner in Southeast Asia. Finally, uh, we pay attention to the social connectivity. So the Yushan Forum and my foundation, Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation are the interface of bridging the bi-directional engagement. And the previous, uh, this previous uh, government left flagship only say uh, something about the first P, the public uh, sector's effort. However, for the uh, people sector uh, led by Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, we call us tough. We focus on the young leader engagement, on civil society connectivity, on think tank collaboration that we produce the policy report and constructive constructive uh, recommendation to both government in Taiwan and our partnership partner government. And we also pay attention to the regional resilience that is related to disaster prevention and disaster preparedness. Apart from that, uh, unlike other foreign policy think tank, we advocate the art and cultural exchange. For example, in 2021, even during the pandemic, we also organized the uh, pan Australian Art Festival in Kaohsiung and also simultaneously in, I think in Surabaya, uh, in one museum, in art museum in Surabaya, so that uh, this uh, soft power uh, message and resources can spread out to the general public, not only limited in our capital city. And we accumulate these uh, four other uh, co-action plan into the annual Yushan Forum so that uh, the government-led government -led program can demonstrate its uh, achievement while the business and the public sec pub uh, the, the, the people sectors NGO can also demonstrate how the solid and resilient uh, cooperation can be achieved jointly with, with Taiwan. And I, I think I, I, I should uh, focus on the uh, talent cultivation to echo to our previous uh, speakers. Southeast Asia language has been listed as the required language for our elementary school students since 2018 in Taiwan. And apart from that, uh, we welcome the foreign students from Southeast Asian country to study in Taiwan, including my university, National Zhengzhou University. We have been hosting uh, hundreds of uh, uh, Indonesian students uh, apart. And the total number of foreign students in Taiwan is 98,000 in 2020 during the pandemic. And it was quite uh, encouraging that almost more than 50% of them comes from our new Southbound policy partner country. Apart from this uh, academic uh, degree uh, uh, oriented students, uh, the government and also the foundation of Taiwan also provide a professional talent capacity building program to increase the human capacity program in industry in disaster preparedness and public governance. And I can share with you that uh, uh, since last year, uh, our national fire uh, agency has been training, providing a training program to the uh, uh, national fire agency, the fire official, fire prevention official in the Philippines. So, so far there has been hundreds of the fire official trained in Taiwan to learn the latest information and skills for the uh, rescue, for the disaster preparedness and prevention. And those information are very useful when they bring back to their province and to share with their colleague. And we do like to uh, advocate this uh, model and also to extend to more partnership with Indonesia, with Malaysia and also with Vietnam, so that we can jointly work out a uh, important best uh, best practice for the common uh, interest 
and also to tackle uh, the natural, natural disaster. And this is the so-called One Country, One Center program since 2018. Indonesia, India, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, and Myanmar are the partner and the stakeholder uh, of this program. And we not only provide a training program for the uh, medical doctors and medical nurses regarding the smart medication, smart public health, we also provide the necessity and also to facilitate the medical commodity trade between Taiwan and our partner country. Then uh, this is the uh, demonstration farm uh, in uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and also to partner with Malaysia. Very interesting uh, and encouraging uh, cooperation project is uh, drawn. We know that in the Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine uh, 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 crisis, drone has been used to be the weapon uh, to attack the civilian. However, uh, given its dual use, drone can be used for the agriculture, for the plantation, especially for the oil palm uh, plantation. So Taiwanese company, uh, along with our Ministry of, of Agriculture, we work together for this uh, cross partner, cross sector partnership to empower the local community, the local farmer with the smart agricultural know how. And with the help of Zhuang, uh, I do believe that the smoke and haze issue in Southeast Asia can be easily addressed in the future. So, uh, with the government-led program, there are five flagship programs uh, administrated by five key ministries, but total number of the government agency among our ministry are 13 out of the 23 to carry out the project and collaboration regarding the new Southbound policy, including our Ministry of Agriculture, including our Ministry of Labor and the Migrant Labor Corporation, and also including the Ministry of uh, of culture and science, cultural ministry of science and technology. And this government agency work very hard to facilitate a more resilient tie with Southeast Asia, with ASEAN country. And I think I have only limited time, but I would like to leave uh, my uh, slide with our participant and dis distinguished guest. And we, as a think tank for new Southbound policy, we come up with the seven years success and achievement of this new Southbound policy and has the soft copy and hard copies. And I will be happy to share those information and material with our title so that uh, the Taiwan office can share with the stakeholder and distinguished guests in the near future. Uh, regarding my concluding remark, although you have already known my key takes away, but I would like to re-emphasize that Taiwan should have the responsibility to safeguard the regional peace and stability when advancing the regional prosperity. Although the new Southbound policy has no military component, but with this policy, I think this government and our administration demonstrate our commitment to uh, advance the regional prosperity so that that can lead to the regional peace and social stability in the region. Please utilize the strategic importance of the new Southbound policy in Indonesia and in Asia. Uh, I would like to send my special appreciation to the distinguished guests here. The region-wide support leads to the seven year milestone and success of this new Southbound policy. The previous discussion also touched upon the uh, supply chain issue. Uh, the international discourse on the supply chain issue was narrowly defined on the semiconductor chips uh, supply chain. But with the uh, focus of the new Southbound policy from the public health, uh, uh, medical care and agricultural and talent training. Those are the critical issue of the survival of the state 
and the stability of the society. So we need to address the importance of moving from the narrowly defined supply chain to the broadly covered survival chain, something related to what ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework highlighted uh, the those five key uh, broader strategy also echo to Taiwan. Taiwan's new southbound policy also echo to that. And this can be the joint effort for securing the survival chain of the Indo-Pacific. My final remark is uh, I do look for as a scholar of Southeast Asian study in Taiwan, based in Taiwan, I do like to see the forging of the prospect the possible prospect of the uh, continuous effort of the new Southbound policy that lead to the possible ASEAN sectoral dialogue partnership with Taiwan in the next decade ahead. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to share with you two publications. The left one is the special report on the new Southbound policy. And you can scan the QR code to download the, the full text of the soft copy. And the right one is our uh, recommendation to strengthen Taiwan Southeast Asia relation. We do some review on the trends and also to see the prospect. Also, I include this uh, slide, uh, this uh, soft copy through the QR code. And you are mostly welcome to download this information. Ho hopefully, we can. Uh, work together in different front and together we can uh, make a big differences. And uh, your comments and questions are mostly welcome. If I have, if, if, if I don't have chance to interact to you in person, you are welcome to send me the email. I will do my, I will work very hard to reply you at the, uh, accordingly. So with that, I would like to thank you for the organizers kind invitation and to organize this meaningful event. And I do look forward to learning from you. Thank you very much. And Terima Kasih. Terima Kasih, uh, Pak Alan. Pak Alan, do you still have time to yes. entertain one or two questions from the audience? Yes, yes, please, my pleasure. So please, if you have question to Professor Alan Aoyang, uh, raise your hand, identify yourself, and then uh, address the question. Anyone? As a moderator, oh, okay. Please, Pat. Um, thank you. My name is Borg from the Singapore Mission to ASEAN. Very quick question. Thank you very much for the presentation on New Summit Policy and 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 it's 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 uh, uh what do you call it success. Um, can I just uh, ask the presenter to elaborate? Is it a combination? The policy is a combination of uh, bilateral um, uh, initiatives as well as multilateral. So you package it together. Is that is that what the new seven policy is is about? Uh, a mixture of bilateral and multilateral uh, uh, initiatives. Thank you. Balan, please. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful question. Well, uh, the new Southbound policy actually is uh, the Taiwan's regional strategy for Asia. Uh, it is a regional approach. Uh, however, the implementation is to conduct through the bilateral interaction and engagement. It is uh, difficult for Taiwan to be recognized and to be involved in the ASEAN, uh, by ASEAN, uh, the organization. However, through the bilateral cooperation, we can identify the common interest and through the joint effort that we can make something different. And uh, this new Southbound policy work very hard to accumulate the bilateral uh, progress and achievement and turn that into the regional, the, the base, uh, basis and foundation for the regional community building process. So I will say it's, it, it is aimed at a regional approach, but the content and practice is bilateral. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pa Alan, and have a good day. Uh, enjoy your time in Taipei. And now we 
we'll move to the second speaker. Uh, we have Ibu Emilia here with us. Ibu Emilia is the senior researcher at our National Research and Innovation Agency, or we know it as GREEN. Uh, Ibu Emilia, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Um, is the PowerPoint ready? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Emilia Justiningrum. I'm the researcher from National Research and Innovation Agency, BRIN, uh, Jakarta. So in uh, my uh, in, in BRIN, I'm the uh, coordinator cluster on foreign policy and international issue, which is conducting research on international politics. And within the cluster, we have five teams, including foreign policy team, Southeast Asian team, um, border team, international migration, and gender and international relations. So today uh, presentation, I would like to um, present on the topic on ASEAN and Taiwan um, cooperation, uh, basically on non-traditional security-based cooperation. Um, before um, we move forward, I would like to see how does the ASEAN work and how it connect with uh, Taiwan in general. In 1960, most of you might already know about this timeline. In 1967, I, ASEAN was established. And then in 1971, um, five power different alliance has been established. It consists of Malaysia, Singapore, um, um, uh, United Kingdom, New Zealand, and 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 the um, and Australia, and then in 1994, uh, ASEAN Regional Forum has been established, and in 2005, is Asia Summit has been established, and then in in 2006, ASEAN Differ uh, Different Minister Meeting has been established. Um, why I put this timeline is important because through this timeline, this has come up the idea of when non-traditional security issue occur in ASEAN. And afterward, in 2007, quadrilateral security dialogue or the Quad has been established that consists of the US, Australia, Japan, and India. And in 2013, um, China introduced Belt and Road Initiative in Indonesia. And in 2021, uh, AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom, and the US established a security dialogue. Why the timeline is important? I would like to highlight here, especially in nine, between 1994 and 1996. This is the time when um, Asia Regional Forum was established and ASEAN Defense Ministerial Meeting. At that point, um, ASEAN state recognized that there are non-traditional issues in ASEAN. What is exactly non-traditional issues? This is basically the issue that based on non-military. It has like several character. First, it is transnational. It's not only happen in one country, but involve more than one country, either uh, entirely domestic or exclusively interested. And then it occur in short notice. It's happened very quick, but it's read quickly because of globalization and the innovation of technology. And then the the threat cannot be eliminated completely, but it need it can be uh, mitigated by using coping mechanism. And it requires not only state level solution, but only regional and global level collaborations. And the object of security is not only the states, but it's the, the people, the society, either in, in local level, regional level, or international level. From the definition of uh, non traditional security, it is a foundation that from the um, issue, the challenges, the threat is, is an enabler, is a, is a starting point for regional cooperation. Because um, the NTS itself, um, the, charac the character of transnational, it provides opportunity for the country to search for commonality of the purpose. This is because if ASEAN cannot fit in former regional organization like ASEAN, or formal uh, grouping like IRF or ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting, but how the relation can happen by utilizing this issue, by connecting, by using this issue, this is the pathway for Taiwan and ASEAN to connect to each other. And also by um, emphasizing on non-traditional security issue, there is less political issue, less sensitivity. 
if we talk about defense, military, security is all high level. But in the not related security, they mostly related to natural disaster, climate change, migration, terrorism, as less political impediment, they as make easier for the ASEAN countries, not ASEAN as a regional organization, to collaborate, to communicate with Taiwan in general. And also it costs, it provides favorable circumstances. It means that it's not only state level, it provides um, confident building measure, building trust among the people, building trust among the community, building trust about grouping, building trust about, let's say, um, like, um, parliament members. Um, they can work to each other without the formal organization name ASEAN, uh, the frame that uh, um, uh, Taiwan cannot, cannot um, include in, in other framework, including as, uh, IRF or East Asia Summit or ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting. And also because um, many countries share vulnerability to the challenges, the NTS challenges, is great multi-layer governance. It means that uh, many actors involved, the people, the community, the group, um, from uh, several background, can be um, a group of uh, parliament members, can be a group of military, but they uh, they act in an office, unofficial capacity. This is part of the uh, platform the ASEAN members or ASEAN uh, uh, countries can share collaboration and cooperation with Taiwan. And there is breakthrough within ASEAN when ASEAN Defense Minister meeting, it basically in 2006, start advancing regional and defense cooperation into higher level. It means they create understanding that face-to-face um, -face war are not no longer exist in ASEAN, but there are interested conflict, like say the uh, interested conflict in Southern Thailand in Patani, interested conflict in Southern uh, Philippines in Moro on before um, 2004 it was in Aceh and before in 2010 it was in Papua. But there are also the problem that involve non-military uh, threat. And in 2009, the ADMM for the first time, they recognized that they will be the platform to address non traditional issue in ASEAN countries. And within uh, the year, they develop a platform called ASEAN Military Asset and Capacities in uh, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief. It means ASEAN will start contribute in case in cooperation related with natural disaster. And with the um, um, trigger uh, factor start in Indian Ocean Tsunami, the ASEAN start creating a center, ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Center, that uh, as a platform, the ASEAN member state to collaborate with each other and also with the dialect partner including with Taiwan that is not um, within the framework of formal member of regional organization. And beside that, ASEAN Defense Establishment and Civil Society Organization Cooperation on NTS provide that this um, framework is not only in the level of foreign minister, it's not only on the level of defense minister, but it's on also involved second threat including the academic, the think tank, the society, the group, your youth, the, the younger people, they're able to uh, collaborate with each other to address one of the issue on the NTS. Um, I, this is one of the example on how the ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting respond to the issue of the NTS, um, particularly on the pandemic. In the start in February 2020, um, the ADMM uh, made a joint statement of ASEAN Defense Minister on cooperation against the disease. And then it was followed by in March 2020, when ASEAN Economic Minister uh, agreed to join, make a joint statement to strengthen ASEAN economic resilience to respond to the outbreak of COVID-19. It means it has become an understanding for the ASEAN minister, not only the defense minister, but also the economic minister to respond to the COVID-19. And then in April 2020, the health minister uh, and ASEAN plus three health minister agree on a joint statement on the, on, on the uh, response of the outbreak of the uh, COVID-19. And in, still in the same month, ASEAN Coordinating Council meeting is established. And at the declaration of ASEAN um, 
summit in COVID-19 in April 2020, it has become the regional framework for the ASEAN to cooperate to each other in um, uh, respond to the COVID-19. This is how one of the issue, if non-traditional security, including the pandemic, has been um, adjust, has been accepted, has been elaborated within the ASEAN organization by utilizing the platform and ASEAN Defense Missile Meeting. It had moved forward into health ministers, economic ministers, they all of them decide to work to each other. Um, the document on ASEAN Comprehensive Security Network, it uh, it occurred based on the mandate of the 36th ASEAN Summit in June 2020. It uh, focused on um, three things, reopening the uh, region and then recovery of the region and how to build the resilience of the regions, and not only from the state level, but also from the society level. It focused on five sectors, including health, human security, market and economic integration, digital transformation, sustainability, and resilience. On the point of digital transformation, this is one of the point the ASEAN countries start to recognize because during COVID-19, the activities on digital economy are increasing. This is why it's one of the point that ASEAN Comprehensive uh, Recovery Framework want to put emphasis on to um, recognize that digital transformation is one of important sectors in ASEAN. And the 10 countries at the moment in 2020 agree on the implementation plan of the, um, of the ASEAN Comprehensive Security uh, Recovery Framework. And how does this framework can connect with Taiwan? Since Taiwan um, launched the South, uh, new South Korean policy, it, Taiwan has begun one of the potential partner for the ASEAN countries for ASEAN member states to develop policy relationship. And also the South Korean policy is not, um, is developing the emphasis to strengthen people to people connection. With This is the one thing that opened the door for the cooperation among ASEAN because in ADMM start the uh, cooperation on civil society, then it provide platform for Taiwan by using new software policy to cooperate through the framework of new people to build connectivity. And there are a lot of opportunity for us as ASEAN as well as um, Taiwan, because the cooperation is with 10 member states, um, including Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Philippines, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. And then it provides wider global engagement for Taiwan because ASEAN for the first time is opened the door for cooperation uh, by using ASEAN Defense Missile Meeting and uh, Taiwan from New South Wales policy. And with the starting point of to respond to COVID-19, it, it is a clue that when the ASEAN opened the door, when the ASEAN recognized that non threatening security threat is occurred and it became the important, significant issue within the ASEAN Regional Forum and ASEAN Defense Missile Meeting, then open the door for a current or existing collaboration with Taiwan as with future cooperation with Taiwan. I think this is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Emilia. Uh, if you have question, please hold it for a moment. We will go to the third speaker. Uh, our third speaker is Ms. Rateh Kabinawa. Uh, he, she used to be affiliated with the Binus University, uh, but I don't know whether she will return to Binus University once she finishes her PhD. And I know Rateh for quite a long time, and she is one of the most consistent scholars who focus on Indonesia and Taiwan relations. So Rateh, you have the floor. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, um, yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Mas Broto Wardoyo, for your very kind introduction. Um, yeah, I was uh, affiliated with Venus University, but now I am a PhD candidate uh, at the University of Western Australia. And uh, 
uh, I'm now finishing my uh, doctoral studies, hopefully at the end of this year. So that's that is the main reason actually I couldn't be in Jakarta today to uh, talk about the future of Taiwan and ASEAN relations. Uh, before moving to my slides, I would like to thank for, uh, to thank the uh, Center for Southeast Asian uh, Studies uh, in Indonesia and particularly the Taipei Economic and Trade Office that has been almost the most cooperative partner for me in developing or helping uh, doing my research on Taiwan's foreign policy in Southeast Asia. So I know I have a very limited time, but so then I will try not to uh, repeat what other speakers have said, especially about the new South One policy, because everyone knows already about the policy. So I will start my um, slides by looking at the variation of the One China policy in Southeast Asia, particularly. As we may know, countries in the region establish um, diplomatic relations with Beijing and adhere to the One China policy. However, there is no single One China policy, and each country has different practices and understanding of their respective One China policy. Here is a summary of the variation I cited from the work of a Singaporean scholar, Ye Yan Chong. Uh, the variation means that each country set up their own wiggle room, of course, to engage with China and Taiwan. And it is in the interest of each state in managing the cross trade issue. So when someone mentions one China policy, the meaning could be different from one country to another. So building from this uh, understanding of one China policy, uh, countries in the region also define the base way to engage with Taiwan, despite the absence of political diplomatic relation with Taiwan, representative missions were set up between Taiwan and these countries in the 1990s, acting as the facto embassies and facilitating cooperation in various sectors. Um, it is important to note that while most of the Southeast Asian representative offices in Taipei or Taiwan are commissioned under their respective Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Indonesian Economic and Trade Office um, in Taipei operates under the authority of the Ministry of Trade. So it has led to asymmetrical relation and coordination between IETO and TETO that maybe we will need to address in the future or uh, about these asymmetrical relations between IETO and TETO in Jakarta. In explaining the relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, I divided them into three stages of development. The first stage is building regional ties. Uh, it is especially a particular where Taiwan began fostering regional connections with neighboring countries through exchanges in education, agriculture, investment, and workforce cooperation. So uh, when we talk about the early relationship between Taiwan and ASEAN, they started from education agriculture, investment, and workforce. Then moving on, the second stage began when the opposition party in Taiwan, the Democratic Progressive Party, or the DPP, the incumbent, uh, the incumbent government, won the presidential election for the first time at that time in 2000, uh, um, marking a new milestone in Taiwan's democratic development. Uh, during that stage, Taiwan stepped up its regional ties by expanding exchanges in various forms, including higher education, via scholarships, research fellow, and civil society engagement. So, um, some um, uh, so um, for those who are receiving Taiwan government scholarship, for example, it was started in two thousand and five. So then. Taiwan, during the during this period as well, Taiwan also tried to pursue bilateral FTAs, uh, uh, so-called bilateral FTA, free trade agreements with countries in the region. And it was um, successful with Singapore, but has not yet progressed into other negotiation with other countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Philippines, and Thailand. And the last stage is deepening regional ties where Taiwan and Southeast Asia countries entered a new phase of their engagement in various sectors, um, uh, including um, 
facilitated by the new staff bond policy. I think the, the other two speakers, especially Alan Howe, Professor Alan Howe, have, has mentioned very clearly about the new soft bond policy, so I will not go into detail of the policy, just a brief overview of the policy framework. So it promotes economic collaboration, conduct talent exchange, share resources, and forging regional uh, regional links with, with the NSP target countries. Uh, what makes the NSP difference? Just a uh, just a brief uh, brief review. Uh, Taiwan also has previously has had the Southward policy in the nineteen ninety four up to two thousand, and it focused mainly on economic and trade exchanges. But now the new Southward policy expanding cooperation from economic and trade to uh, people to people uh, relations, and it also aims to uh, build two way exchanges. So not only Taiwan people or Taiwanese business or tourists coming to Southeast Asia, but also it is expected that Southeast Asian tourists, Southeast Asian business also uh, come to Taiwan to do business, uh, sightseeing and other um, and other activities as well. And it includes public and private sector participation, unlike the previous software policy, mostly state-led cooperation. Um, at the time, so and it also expand the member the the target countries not only Southeast Asia but also South Asia, South Asia, New Zealand, and Australia. So now let uh, let me examine various achievements that Taiwan has achieved since the promotion of the NSP. I don't think I need to uh explain further about investment Taiwanese investment in China and ASEAN six because I think the previous session I uh, had mentioned it already but one of my point is that with the new soft bond policy Taiwan is now uh sitting at the top 10 foreign direct investments according to the ASEAN statistical year yearbook Taiwan now sitting as the top 10 foreign direct investment sources for ASEAN country and Taiwan also held a prominent position in export and import activities, ra ranking among the top 10 trading partners for ASEAN. Uh, the next one is the uh, on the higher education front that was mentioned before by Professor Alan Howe. Taiwan has experienced a significant increase in student enrollment from each of Southeast Asian nations. As you can see now, they are now over 200 thousands Southeast Asian students in Taiwan with um, the leading one, as you can see, is uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, then followed by Indonesia. However, uh, this number is not reciprocal in a way that uh, the number of the Taiwanese students studying or visiting Southeast Asia is far less um, significant than the inbound from Southeast Asian country. The majority of Taiwanese youth remain oriented towards the United States, Australia, and Japan in their international outlook. So it presenting a challenge to the objective of the NSP of fostering two-way exchanges between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, particularly in the higher education front. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic, Taiwan managed to sustain reciprocal tourism cooperation with countries in the region. <clears throat> this table illustrates uh, a balance in the number of inbound and outbound tourists between Taiwan and Southeast Asia, thanks to the easing of visa restrictions under the NSP, which ultimately increased the number of inbound tourists from ASEAN to Taiwan. According to the ASEAN Statistical Yearbook in 2022, Taiwan ranks among the top 10 in visitor arrivals to ASEAN, competing with countries like China, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, one thing that is um, one aspect that is very important between Taiwan and ASEAN is the presence of Southeast Asian migrant workers in Taiwan. Uh, we currently have so uh, like more than seven hundred thousand migrant workers in Taiwan from Southeast Asia countries uh, with Vietnam and Indonesia leading the populations. And the presence of large number of Southeast Asian migrant workers in Taiwan has raised the attention of sending governments in dealing with this worker safety and protection in Taiwan. 
it is imperative following Beijing's uh, military exercise that occurred almost daily in the Taiwan Strait. The Indonesian and the Philippines government, for example, they have mentioned the urgency of developing a, a contingency plan should the cross strait tension arise into an armed conflict. So it's not about just geopolitical war, it's also about the humanitarian um, humanitarian crisis that would occur if the tension arise into an armed conflict. And this must be a very pressing issues because you know how to how to evacuate those 700,000 people from Taiwan to Southeast Asia back to Taiwan and considering the Taiwan's geographical location surrounding by waters on how then if war breaks out in the Taiwan Strait then how Southeast Asian countries would address with this issue it's a big issue for the current governments at the moment, especially the Philippines government, they have mentioned about this uh, this thing in their uh, national um, uh, foreign policy strategic and defense strategics too. Um, the promotion of the NSP also promotes the development of Southeast Asian studies in Taiwan. And I think this is the most uh, particular aspect that is missing from uh, Taiwan and Southeast Asia relations, particularly on academic and knowledge exchanges. Um, in Taiwan, there have been a various, um, a quite growing interest in learning about Southeast Asia. So in Taiwan, they have the uh, Taiwan Association of Southeast Asian Studies. They have uh, like Professor Alan Howe Institution, Taiwan ASEAN Exchange Foundation, or Center for Southeast Asian Studies in learning about Southeast Asia. And there are also quite a number of programs or departments teaching um, Southeast Asian studies in Taiwan. However, uh, there is no single Taiwan Studies Association established in Southeast Asia. So the development of Southeast Asian studies in Taiwan were quite um, promising. However, the development of Taiwan studies in Southeast Asia is missing. So for those who uh, work in the academic community or epistemic community might feel, might think, or might uh, think in the future on how then to build a balanced relationship between Taiwan and Southeast Asia in the field of academic and knowledge exchanges because it is very important to have knowledge about Taiwan in Southeast Asia. So then because Taiwan has different trajectories, history, um, um, uh, culture, economics, and politics that need to be understood not only by academic in the region, but also policymaker in the region in order to engage well with Taiwan. So Taiwan now is trying to learn about Southeast Asia. Now, this is our turn as a Southeast Asian um, um, scholars or, South, or Southeast Asian government coming from the government to also understand Taiwan. And this development also lacking, uh, if we look at in the into the uh, framework of global Taiwan studies, uh, there have been set up various association facilitating research, educational exchanges, and knowledge ex knowledge exchanges in other parts of the world. Let's say in North America, they have North American Taiwan Studies Association. In in European, they have European Association of Taiwan Studies. In Australia, here where I am based at the moment. We do have the Australian Taiwan Studies Association. In Japan, there have one, but not, no one in Southeast Asia. So maybe this is a homework that Pak Broto as a scholar in UI need to address in the future about how to build a, a balance academic and reciprocal academic and acknowledge exchanges between Taiwan and Southeast Asia in terms of uh, building a sustainable Taiwan studies in the region. Um, so to end up my presentation, I offer several recommendations that we could discuss in the, in the Q&A session in addressing the asymmetrical relations between Taiwan and ASEAN member countries. First, um, Taiwan needs to upgrade and expand its bilateral investment agreements with countries in the region, intensify the study abroad program, 
as a core unit or coursework for a minimum one semester so to Southeast Asian countries among Taiwanese university. Um, explore the potential of track to dialogue between the two regions in promoting confidence building measures that is, I would say, lacking now. Investigate pot potential cooperation in the supply chains because supply chains was mentioned several times in the previous discussion and also provide further study in supporting the policy. Um, yeah, incorporate migrant domestic workers and fishermen in Taiwan into Taiwan Labor Standard Act because now they are they are excluded from the uh, Taiwan's Labor Standard Act and also maximize the potential of Taiwan's alumni with social science and humanities like Masbroto Wardoyo to pick, uh, to develop and set up a regional Taiwan Studies Association. Upgrade and strengthen the role of Taiwan Center in various university by including uh, incorporating element, elements, elements of teaching and research on Taiwan politics, society, economics, and culture. In college, learning Southeast Asian languages among Taiwanese diplomats posted in Southeast Asian countries and utilize the use of social media and Southeast Asian languages among Taiwanese members of commerce in promoting their humanitarian and social cultural activities. Okay, I think that's it from my presentation. Thank you for listening and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Rate and also Bu Emilia for being considerate to the time arrangement. We still have nine minutes. Uh, if you have question, feel free to raise your hand, identify yourself and address the question. Anyone? Please, but... uh, thank you. My name is Emil Radiansha from University of Paramadina, Jakarta. Uh, I have a question for the three of the speakers. Uh, it's a simple question, actually. What is the main obstacle of the implementation of the new southbound policy? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mas Emil. But we already missing uh, Pak Alan. So, uh, Ibu Emil, would you mind to answer first? Thank you, uh, Bapak from Paramadena University. So how we can implement new southbound policy? As we know that um, there are many opportunity for Taiwan to develop cooperation and collaboration with ASEAN member states. Let's say uh, with BRIN. BRIN is Indonesian government-based national research and innovation agency. So even though there is no formal um, 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 relation between Indonesia and Taiwan had cooperation on the research between Indonesian Research Center and Taiwan Research Center is um, is possible. It's still going on until now. So the first time that we have cooperation with TETO, Taiwan Economic and Trade Office, between Research Center for Politics and at the beginning, it was still LIPI and uh, Indonesian Institute of Scientists in 2010, still going on until now and this is the example of how um, um, collaboration between the two countries can be implemented without formal membership in, in, in any organization and it's still going on because it's not only developing a seminar we also be doing joint research together joint publication together that uh, we can uh, be proud that in 2021, uh, Research Center for Politics uh, organized an academic paper with Taiwan with the topic on how the ASEAN countries in Taiwan respond to the COVID-19. And in 2022, we published an academic paper in cooperation between the two organizations on the building people-to-people -people, uh, collaboration between ASEAN and Taiwan. So I think it is one of the example of how the implementation of new software policy in, let's say, in print as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bu Emil. Prate, would you mind? Um, sorry, Mas Broto, I missed the questions <laughs> before. Can I, can the questions re repeat it? I mean, yeah, I think the question is, what is the obstacles? Obstacles. Okay. Yes. Well, um, if we talk about the obstacles, I would definitely say one China policy is still the obstacle. Because as I say, um, with the, with those variation of one China policy, 
um, each country has their own uh, understanding of engaging Taiwan, and it's not uh, getting into um, the it's not getting into the same page of how to engage with Taiwan. But then, um, and then because um, even though we say, oh, it is people to people, people to people does not include politics. I wouldn't believe on that statement because even though it is people to people, it still involves the state. It's still involving political side of the state. So of course, one China policy is the first obstacle. And the second thing is that how to build, how to address the asymmetrical relations between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. As I mentioned uh, in my presentation that in terms of higher education exchanges, we do have this asymmetrical relations. In terms of knowledge and academic cooperation, we do have this uh, asymmetrical relations between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. So um, it is the homework that we actually need to address in order to, uh, to sort of mitigate the obstacle to uh, so that the new sovereign policy can fully achieve its goal of improving two-way exchanges between Taiwan and Southeast Asia. Thank you. Thank you, Rate. Uh, we still have a few minutes. If there is still anyone want to, please book. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Tulus from Budilur University. Uh, I might be going a little bit into the details and also technical uh, because I'm at, uh, right now I'm in charge of an online cultural program with Japan in my university. But then uh, in the progress of our program, we also involve uh, students from Taiwan as well and also from China for one time, but then it doesn't uh, continue, uh, unfortunately. But my question is, uh, okay, uh, to what extent ASEAN can play a role in was it in improving the Taiwan global studies by I don't know optimizing relationships with other countries in Asia and also within the boundaries of new southbound policy. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Tulus. Uh, so Rate, do you want to start first? Yeah, I'm digesting the questions actually, but then, okay, I will try to answer uh, the questions from Ibu Tulus from Budi Luhur. Thank you for the questions. It is very interesting. If I'm not mistaken that uh, your question is that to what extent ASEAN can play role in building or developing Taiwan studies in the region. Taiwan, can, uh, sorry, Southeast Asia has, uh, Southeast Asian countries have the resources from, from where, like, the, the alumni, the alumni, the graduates of Taiwan studies. As you can see in my slides that we send around 200,000 um, 200, um, Southeast Asian students in Taiwan and once they graduate from Taiwan, then, then they will, they usually, uh, those who are doing PhD particularly will return to their home university in ASEAN countries. So uh, especially with the humanities and social science backgrounds, and I think this is the homework for the Taipei Economic and Trade Office as well, in order to let us know how many how many graduates with background of humanities and social sciences graduated from Taiwan, making a, a database on that, contacting them, and set up a meeting. Set up a meeting. Zoom meeting is fine. Then we move on to the discussion of Taiwan studies in the region. I, I believe Southeast Asia has the resources uh, to build that sort of to develop the Taiwan studies in the region. And uh, and it has both uh, resources, human resources and institutional building as well. And I believe cooperation in uh, Taiwan studies would, shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be considered as some sensitive issues because it is about academic exchanges, it's about cooperation in higher education, it's about teaching and research about Taiwan. And we actually put, uh, I, I think I quoted one of the professor in Taiwan saying that Taiwan studies could battle for peace. So by, by, by having Taiwan studies in the region, we can help mitigate the crisis we can help battle for the peace in the, our region. Thank you. Thank you, Rate. Well, Emilia, you have the floor. Thank you, Ibu Tulus. Um, how to strengthen Taiwan studies in uh, Southeast Asian countries? So um, 
last year in National Research and Innovation Agency in Brin, we organized, we are the host of Southeast Asian uh, PNL program, PNL conference, which is one of the funding is from um, um, uh, ASEAS. And I was in just on the panel on international politics. And then one of the theme on the panel is the Taiwan um, studies. It does mean that there are platform to strengthen Taiwan studies. There are many platform. Um, Southeast Asia P annual conference is just one of the platform. It was last year, and um, for the speaker who present um, the paper, and then we invite. Um, some of them to publish together in the two conference proceeding that will be published by ISA Singapore. And the event will continue next year, uh, CASIA annual conference in Manila, which is the uh, University of Philippines will be the host. So I think there are platform that Taiwan studies can grow stronger in ASEAN countries, not only in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Emilia. Uh, echoing what Pa Alan already said before uh, that together we can make difference so I think uh, it took uh, it takes we and also Taiwan uh, ASEAN member countries and also Taiwan uh, to set up a brighter future for our relationship uh, but another point that I think it's also important for our session because the three speakers talk about people to people relations and in particular, talk about the needs to establish uh, Taiwan studies in Indonesia or even in ASEAN. So I think Pak Steve and also uh, others from Teto, you need to really consider whether this will be a good opportunity to introduce Taiwan and also to uh, get us closer uh, in the future. So I don't want to hold you from your lunch. Uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you for joining us and thank you, Marate, Ibu Emilia, and also Pak Alan. Uh, thank you very much, Pak Broto. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Broto Wardoyo, for the very productive discussion. Uh, next, I would like to invite distinguished guests, excellencies, uh, ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, to have one uh, hour lunch and break. The lunch was served um, at the foyer in this room. And we will uh, start back at 1.30 p.m. Thank you and enjoy your lunch. We would like to invite distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to be seated. The event will begin soon. Thank you. Your Excellencies, Ambassador, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have enjoyed your lunch and we will now continue with the third session, Regional Security Challenges in ASEAN. I would like to invite the moderator to kindly come up on stage, Mr. Felamara Anjaya, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Southeast ASEAN Studies Indonesia. Please, Mr. Felamara, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, uh, your Excellencies and distinguished guests, distinguished speakers, uh, a good, very good evening. Uh, today's uh, our uh, third session, which will uh, discuss about the regional security challenges in ASEAN. Uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Anak Agun. Yeah, please, uh, yeah, please take your seat, sir. A regional security challenges in ASEAN. Now we are living in a world. Now ASEAN is, uh, is though it is, looks like peaceful, but it is not peaceful. As we see in the South China Sea and also the main, uh, 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 which is the main country which that create, is creating problem is China. China's military deployment, China's uh, uh, building of artificial islands in South China Sea and claiming uh, uh, and uh, surrounding Taiwan and harassing Taiwan and also harassing like uh, uh, Vietnam and also fishermen from the uh, 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 Philippines and Malaysia, Indonesia. So it is a big problem. And also there is also big, uh, uh, also there is a uh, now 
uh, in the name of freedom of navigation. US is also opposing China strongly in South China Sea. So their tensions between the China and the US also is creating a big security problem for uh, ASEAN. Uh, so we, we have uh, so many issues. So maybe I think we have also like uh, non-traditional security issues also like uh, narcotism, separatism, uh, like uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, we have also so many other problems also. But today we will focus on uh, what are the main regional security challenges in ASEAN. So uh, uh, Mr. Teher is ready? Call yes, there. I am. Yeah, okay, thank you. So now I will read just uh, his uh, profile. Call Thayer is a Emeritus Professor of Public Politics at the Un United uh, South Wales uh, School of Humanities and Social Sciences. He is current, currently Director of uh, Thayer Consultancy, a small business registered in Australia in 2002 that provides political analysis uh, of current regional security issues and other research support uh, to selected clients. Professor Thayer was educated at Brown University uh, in the United States, 1967. He holds an MA in Southeast Asian Studies from Yale, 1971, and PhD in International Relations from the Australian National University, ANU, 1977. He studied Vietnamese language at Yale, Cornell, and Southern Illinois, and uh, university, the language uh, at the University of Missouri at Columbia, and a uh, Lao language uh, at Southern uh, Illinois University, uh, Carbonadel. Before embarking on an academic career, Carl served in Vietnam with the International Voluntary Services and as a voluntary teacher in uh, Botswana uh, with the Unitarian University Services Committee. He began his professional career in 1976 as a lecturer at the Bendigo Institute of Technology, renamed the Bendigo College of Advanced Education. In 1979, he joined the University of New South Wales and taught first in its Faculty of Military Studies at the Royal Military College, uh, Duntan, uh, and uh, then at the University College, uh, ADFEA. He served as head of the School of Politics from 1950, 1995 to 97. In 1998, he was promoted to full professor and emeritus professor in 2010. So Carl Thayer is a, an expert on Southeast Asia. He is a very good uh, knowledge about uh, Vietnam, South China Sea, and other issues. So now the floor is yours, Mr. Carl Thayer. Yeah, you have 15 minutes to speak. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Hanoi, uh, where I have just attended, given a public lecture on And so I'm delighted uh, to be addressing colleagues uh, in Indonesia from here. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Aris Ban for the invitation. And I want to apologize for not being able to attend this morning session uh, because I was uh, in engaged. Now, I uh, cue you to change the side, please, and external uh, issues. And I'm going to address three major internal ones in the interest of time. And the first is the situation in Mira. In Mira issued another declaration deploring it. There is no end in sight, uh, although the, the conflict is used to say that uh, it's all ASEAN uh, without direct in military intervention that could go on for years. And no one is uh, contemplating or even thinking that. It's a case where Russia and China uh, dealing with Myanmar. Um, and as a five point consensus and a special envoy of the ASEAN chair, uh, and no has got just got to persist in that and try to keep external intervention as, as limited as possible, keep calling for a ceasefire and trying to make contact with all the relevant stakeholders. We had an end run, an American football term, uh, 
Thailand began to invite representatives of Miramar to Bangkok for discussions, which seemingly un undercut Indonesia as ASEAN chair. And, and that's a, a, a serious blow to ASEAN's unity on that. Uh, in addition to all the fighting that's going on is, is dealing with displaced persons and the tens of thousands that have fled the Rakhine state in, in Bangladesh and, and elsewhere. And again, that has to be dealt with to return them uh, with dignity and safety. So, uh, and ASEAN itself has got to look beyond uh, suspension of membership. So since the coup, uh, ASEAN's taken the position not to allow representatives from Miramar a seat at the table for the summits and foreign ministers meeting. Uh, and I say, instead of blaming ASEAN, it's just the reality that there is no immediate solution uh, and to ending the conflict. The use of armed intervention forces is not going to help. There's no hope of a UN mandate to take all reasonable uh, steps, uh, all including the use of force, so that ASEAN just has to continue to manage and try to restrain external powers from intervening. The second is less serious, but it is nonetheless long overdue, and that's the membership of Timor-Leste uh, as, as the next member of ASEAN. I've been privileged to hear the ambassador from Timor Leste speak publicly in Australia, and she laments the delay, 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 uh, and why they can't meet the criteria. And there is a roadmap, and ASEAN has recently promised capacity building, uh, money to train up to 40 uh, uh, officials uh, from Timor Leste for the duties that they would need to take on should they join. But in other words, uh, uh, Timor Leste is there. It's forming relations with China that concern Australia, that shouldn't concern ASEAN because all of ASEAN has trade relations, et cetera, but it's better to have Timor-Leste inside the fold than outside to reduce the kind of interference or leveraging. So those are two issues. Next slide for my third internal issue, please. Yeah, and this is decision-making. Uh, this has come up at the most recent summit uh, if you look at the very last line, there's for several years now been discussions that have really gotten nowhere about having qualified majority voting, that below the summit level, that when an issue comes up, that ASEAN should be able to make a majority decision, and those that don't agree with it can, like in the economic formulas, uh, wait till they can catch up, uh, but let ASEAN make a decision. This latest development was, holds some promise uh, is about emergency or urgent situation. So we're talking about rules of procedure to support decision-making processes at the ASEAN summit by the ASEAN Community Council. And there it is to refer matters to the summit in urgent and specific situation where consensus cannot be achieved and allow decisions and effective response in urgent situations in a timely manner. And so uh, that's an internal issue, but it's another step uh, in firming up ASEAN uh, rather than just holding back uh, and, and letting uh, situations drift itself. So now I'd like to turn to external issues in the South China Sea will feature. So next slide, please. Uh, as our moderator and chairman for this panel indicated, uh, we're seeing a step up in Chinese aggressiveness uh, in most recent cases of trying to interrupt supply uh, to second Thomas Shaw. It's now moving closer to the US, Japan, Australia for, for, for patrols, Coast Guard, hosting big exercises, Commandag coming up. Uh, Japan amphibious forces are participating trilateral naval exercises. So there's a risk of uh, incidents uh, occurring, but it's to defend the Philippine sovereignty uh, against Chinese squatting uh, with uh, fisher, fishing, fishing fleets. So for th over 31 years, since 1992, when ASEAN made its first statement on the South China Sea due to tensions between China and Vietnam, in an area known as Vanguard Bank, which is the same sites 
in 2023 that tensions are occurring. Uh, ASEAN issued its first statement, didn't name the parties, but called for a code of conduct. And in 1995, with the occupation of Mischief Reef by China, ASEAN issued its second uh, statement of concern, again, not naming parties, calling for a code of conduct. What's little known is that in March 2000, code of conducts were exchanged between ASEAN and China. They were short documents, about two and a half pages each, but they disagreed on a whole variety of areas such as military exercises and the geographic scope. So nothing happened. But two years later, the parties agree to a political statement, the Declaration on Conduct of Parties in the South China Sea, or DOC. And that's been the template. Uh, terms of reference and an ASEAN-China joint working group to implement the DOC is the key negotiating uh, forum. Now, in August 2018, ASEAN and China announced that they had brought together the submissions uh, of all the parties except Laos and Miramar into a single draft negoti negotiating text for a code of conduct in the South China Sea. Back then, it was supposed to go through three readings, and we've had the completion of the second reading under Indonesia's watch. So uh, progress is being made. Indonesia, at the summit uh, approved and by, and by the foreign ministers, to come up with guidelines for accelerating the early conclusion of an effective stance of code of conduct in the South China Sea in accordance with international law with a putative deadline of three years. So in 2018, China said it was gonna be three years. Uh, now we're seeing another three years come up. That's not set in, in, in stone. So in the most recent statement, Chinese assertiveness was addressed by modifying the past boilerplate statements in the South China Sea section at the very end of the joint statement referring to serious incidents in the area, including actions that put the safety of all persons at risk. Many observers felt that was underwhelming and that ASEAN still refuses to call out or name or shame uh, the actions that are upsetting, that indicate no self-restraint and are threatening to regional peace and security. And that situation has prompted speculation or consideration in the Philippines that they should again take legal action against China under the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. That they won an award in 2016, it hasn't been executed. Uh, China has completely violated that. Uh, so next slide to bring us up to there, in the next three years, and this is a big, big ask, here are the following key areas that need to be resolved. What is the geographic scope? There's reference in the single draft to disputed areas. In 2000, during the first exchange, uh, China wouldn't allow the Paracel Islands to be included. Uh, Vietnam wanted those uh, included. Uh, what is the dispute resolution mechanism? UNCLOS uh, has, for arbitral cases, compulsory dispute. But what happens if there's a violation of, of this code of conduct? How will those decisions be enforced? What's the legal status? Will it be a treaty or what? Um, and only Vietnam has proposed that every nation's national assembly or parliament ratify it, deposit their instruments with the ASEAN Secretary General, who in turn would deposit it with the UN. And finally, and this is very important, the role of third parties. Uh, China considers all the third parties as countries outside the region, and they have no right or say in this. Uh, they shouldn't conduct military exercises unless anybody, unless anybody objects, and all natural resource exploration can only take place, according to China, between the national companies of China and ASEAN members uh, itself. Uh, so that's where we are on the South China Sea. Now I'd like to, the next uh, item that ASEAN has to deal with, slide please, is the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. This has been reviewed. Uh, the, the idea is to mainstream its four priority areas, 
within the ASEAN-led mechanisms, and that's the ASEAN Regional Forum, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting, plus the East Asia Summit, for example. Uh, and an ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum was held under Indonesia's watch. Uh, and that, that shows you a positive development uh, and the role that, that the ASEAN chair can play. So uh, the four priority areas would reinforce an open and inclusive, transparent, regional regional architecture, uh, resilient regional architecture, I should say, uh, with concrete projects and trust building to, to go along with this in the mainstreaming, do something practical. But this is whistling in the dark. Uh, the ASEAN-led mechanisms are the most important, the leaders-led East Asia Summit, uh, 10 ASEAN and its dialogue, eight dialogue partners, uh, saw a no-show by China, Russia, and the United States. And uh, that has uh, weakened, I think, uh, ASEAN's position on this. So the next chairman, which is the Philippines, is going to have to work much harder uh, to try to make sure that these major powers show up and listen to views from the region. We can go to the next slide, please. That's also external. This is about Sean Fizz, the Southeast Asian Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty of 1995. And ever since it was adopted, ASEAN has sought to have a protocol signed to adhere to this by all the nuclear weapon states. China immediately jumped in back then and said, we'll do it, we'll sign. And ASEAN uh, wanted to wait until all the nuclear weapon states were on board. Well, this matter has just been revisited. Uh, the executive committee for this particular treaty is exploring whether or not to allow an individual nuclear weapon state that is willing to sign the protocol to do so. Uh, and it must do so without re reservations and provide prior assurance uh, of the commitment in writing to this. So one, China could be the first state to sign the protocol, and then ASEAN would conduct dialogues with the others and try to get them on. But the, the problem that, from my point of view, and everybody's looking at Australia's acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines, is that China is rapidly building up its nuclear arsenal on land, and it's rapidly building up its strategic ballistic missile submarines, which patrol in deep water trenches off the west coast of the Philippines. So they're in the waters that should be covered by this particular treaty uh, because the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Run Treaty is the only treaty I'm aware of that defines ASEAN as not only the landmass, but the territorial sea, exclusive economic zones and continental shelf. And that definitely would include waters uh, owing to the Philippines for sovereign jurisdiction. And China will have over 21 SSBNs by the time Australia even begins uh, receipt of its first nuclear powered but nuclear armed submarine. So now if I could begin to reach my conclusions by looking at challenges for the future. Um, we have uh, just two slides left and I'll hurry through them. Next slide, please. So one is how to address perceptions that ASEAN is institutionally ineffective. And I've already mentioned that, how to get to, to lobby China, Russia, and the US to show up. Another uh, idea that I've had is that ASEAN should have a meeting with the Quad, the US, Japan, Australia, and India, and not for the military side, but on those particular issues that reinforce ASEAN security agenda. There's an ASEAN plus three to do with economic issues, and the Quad wants to coordinate, let's say for COVID relief, making pharmaceuticals, public health, and those measures could concede institution to institution to that. Blue economy is going to be a big issue in the future, uh, dealing with a whole host of non-traditional security issue, but more pressing, and particularly from Indonesia's point of view, the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing by ASEAN and non-ASEAN states in Indonesia's exclusive economic zone, and that's happening. Then there's the challenge of climate change to reach international emission reductions, to get the major powers that have the money to put more into it uh, to assist in meeting those goals. And last, last slide uh, for challenges. The ASEAN Regional Forum, when it was set up years ago, was supposed to be a three-stage process. 
And the second stage was preventative diplomacy. First stage, confidence and trust building. Second stage, preventative diplomacy and approaches to the resolution of the conflict, not conflict resolution. China objected to that. So uh, there's consideration that it should be pressing matter to move to preventative diplomacy and make act, ASEAN more active in that regard, dealing with Miramar and other issues. How to avoid being sucked into US-China rivalry, and particularly if it leads to a crisis in, in Taiwan, to try to prevent that from all costs through ASEAN diplomacy, if it can, but, uh, and, but not taking sides. Stability and denuclearization on the Korean peninsula. Korea keeps firing ballistic missiles. It's in violation of the UN. Uh, nothing in practical sense that ASEAN can do, but it could lend normative weight to calling on that regime to halt uh, ballistic missiles and work for the denuclearization of the Korean peninsula. The war in Ukraine, and now since these slides were submitted, the war in Gaza, they're linked. They destabilize, they lead to global inflation. They're gonna threaten global growth uh, and threaten tensions in wider parts uh, have got to be addressed. And if you're living in Australia like I am and you turn on CNN TV, the war in Ukraine has completely disappeared. Every day it's almost nonstop coverage of, of the crisis in Gaza. And that leads, will America abandon its pivot to the Indo-Pacific? Will it get sucked into a larger Middle East war? Uh, so we, we or will Russia be emboldened to step up in Ukraine because of U.S. distractions? And so uh, the final point and that should be linked with my Korean one is to, there's a, with Russia's uh, pulling out of, of its commitments, uh, ASEAN needs to really pull its weight to get a global consensus on nuclear non-proliferation. That is an extraordinary, uh, serious global issue. Uh, with regional implications given China's development. And thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thayer. It was a very excellent presentation. He has touched many issues like code of conduct in South China Sea and also Asia Pacific uh, uh, security and also uh, so many other issues. Uh, actually, we have to be very careful with the China because China uh, claims more than 90% of the South China Sea based on its nine dash line, because which was, uh, a, 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 according to me, Ill illegal map because the nine, 2016, the per permanent court of arbitration declared it is an illegal one. And also now last uh, August, uh, just uh, last August, the uh, one of the Chinese ministries released a new map claiming the uh, territories of other countries like uh, uh, India, like uh, 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 Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, in Indonesia, but all the countries, they rejected the Chinese claim. And also uh, China published a 10th dash new, 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 it added one more line. So it is called a 10 dash line. So which is now wants to occupy uh, uh, Taiwan by any means. So this is a very dangerous one. So that's why Mr. Tyer rightly said, we need a, a code of conduct to avoid further tensions because we have already document uh, DOC, but that was very uh, not uh, legally powerful. So that's why we want a new uh, code of conduct. So that's why Indonesia and uh, Philippines and Malaysia, Vietnam want uh, uh, every, all the claimant states must respect international rules like uh, unclose, unclose must be implemented. So that's why we, we should uh, not recognize China's claims. So now, uh, uh, we, uh, Mr. Thayer, we will have a, a question and answer session after the other two speakers. Now we have a next speaker, Professor Anak Agung Banyu Parvita. Uh, Anak Agung Banyu Parvita was born on February 6, 1967 in Jakarta. Uh, he is currently working as a professor at uh, Indonesian Defense University. Previously, he used to work as the at the President University. He studied at the Unpar Parayangan University in Bandung. He studied MA in International Relations and Strategic Studies from Lancaster University in November 1994. He received his PhD degree from the Flinders University in Adelaide, Australia. He worked in various positions at Unpar. 
now the floor is yours you have 15 minutes to speak yeah okay thank you yeah please Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introductions from the moderator. And first of all, uh, allow me to express my gratitude to South uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies and also Teto for inviting me for this uh, important uh, seminar. Okay, uh, basically my presentations will be, uh, next please. My presentations will be divided into four uh, sections. The first, uh, of course, uh, I think it is quite important for us to, let's say, discuss about uh, the dynamics of Indo-Pacific, and then uh, it will be followed by the uh, security outlook of ASEAN, and it, I think it's very important because it will be influenced not only uh, internally, but also uh, externally. Then how can we put the, uh, let's say, to map the uh, regional security challenges uh, in ASEAN, and last but not least, try to discuss, and I think that, that this is, will be more interesting to be discussed on how we can uh, put the road ahead for ASEAN. So next slide, please. So uh, if we talk about the regional security challenges in Southeast Asia and particular for ASEAN, I think it is very difficult to separate with these uh, four uh, political security characteristics in the regions. Uh, first of all, I think we have to talk about the grid power competitions, the geopolitical rivalry, especially between US and, and China. And this has a color a lot, not only on the global, but also in regional uh, situations in many parts of the regions, including Southeast Asia. Then, of course, it will be followed by the arms race. And if we can take a look at, let's say, the uh, data from the uh, uh, IISS, the level of arms races is getting uh, worried us. Yeah. So this is a kind of the regions uh, in the world, one of the regions which is very heavily militarized. And then, of course, this can also be followed with the old fashions of IR. We still uh, have, a, let's say, some problems in territorial disputes among uh, the members of ASEAN and also the other, let's say, uh, countries uh, in the regions. And last but certainly not least, we have also to talk about contemporary uh, issues. I think this is something that Ibu Emilia has mentioned earlier uh, on the previous sessions about the importance of the non-traditional non security issues. And I think this kind of four characteristic will, uh, uh, will uh, make a very, let's say, a complicated linkages or nexus on the security challenges of ASEAN. So I think it is very important for us to take into account on the uh, four uh, dynamics, uh, let's say, characteristics in our regions. The next slide, please. So uh, there are also three related geopolitical shifts that we have to, uh, to, 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 to bear in mind when we talk about the regional security challenges in ASEAN or in Southeast Asia. Well, uh, again, as something that I mentioned earlier, this is quite important to also pay attention on the global and regional power politics. I think Professor Taylor and also the moderator has mentioned uh, something uh, a lot about this, uh, the, uh, the, the dry tensions, especially between US and China. Second of all, um, I think this is also uh, due to the uh, consequences of the, one of the consequences of the a war between Russia and Ukraine, we talk about the security of resources or natural resources. We talked, I think, at the previous sessions also talking about the, if I'm not mistaken, Professor Alan uh, mentions about the supply chain. And then last but not least, because we are a very big, broad uh, Indo-Pacific, Indian and Pacific, we have also to take into account uh, the importance of maritime security. So allow me just to give you a very simple illustration uh, next slide, please. On the, the map of Indo-Pacific, and as you can see, of course, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific and especially Indian Ocean, uh, my uh, latest uh, article has been published in a book two days ago in India, uh, Permala, on the, uh, the, the, the role of Indian Oceans in the global peace. You know that uh, these uh, oceans account for 50 to 60 percent of world maritime uh, trade, transit through it, and 30% of the global population's uh, lives in uh, the area. In addition, of course, uh, around 60% of global oil and 26% of global uh, gas reserve uh, are also in this uh, region. So this region is very important in the Pacific. So that is the reason why we have, uh, I think, one of the regional sector challenges for Southeast Asia 
is about also maritime security. And this is something that we have also to take, uh, uh, to pay uh, attention quite seriously. This, the next slide, I would like to show you just, uh, I took this from the uh, ASEAN Security Outlook on 2021, the number of the security issues. And I would like to underline what uh, Ibu Emilia has mentioned earlier. If you take a look at these sessions, I have uh, uh, two slides on this. There are, let's say, a very complicated uh, security of common issues, both traditional, non-traditional, and this is something that I would like to propose talking about the hybrid threats. So if you take a look at this like, list, we can start from the traditional one, like competitions between major powers into transnational crimes. Uh, next slide, please. And the list of the known traditional security issue. And in that list, I think we can at least find 21 security issues, both traditional and non-traditional, or even the combinations between traditional and non-traditional. And this is something that I would like to call as the hybrid threats. The combinations of, let's say, the political, military, economic, even informational threats, environment coming all together. And how will ASEAN cope with this kind of let's say, very complicated uh, security challenges. So uh, the next slide, I would like, and this is something like a kind of summary on how to wrap up the security challenges in our regions. We can start with the military threats. This is very obvious. Then the non-military threats, uh, environmental, uh, illegal logging, uh, drug, and then the combinations between two. So when, when we, take a look, let's see, uh, let's say about the problems of terrorism, then can be uh, categorized into the hybrid threats. So ASEAN itself as the regional institutions will cover this kind of situation. And our last meeting, I mean, uh, I was in Brunei two weeks ago uh, talking with the ADMM uh, workshop on how ASEAN, because next, uh, next month we are going to host the ADMM meeting in Jakarta, 15 to 16 November, if I'm mistaken. So I think I, I will underline what Ibu Emilia has mentioned that we have to cover those kind of problems. And this is very, very complicated one. Yeah. And how can we are going to cope with that? This is something that's very interesting to be discussed here. So next one. So if we are talking about the regional security challenges, then we can also we cannot also avoid the uh, four interrelated uh, area domains of our problems. The first one is domestic and internal stability. And Professor Taylor has mentioned something about Myanmar. And probably we have also to take about the uh, extremism in South uh, Thailand, Mindanao, and not mentions about Indonesia. So domestic and internal stability is very important because it will create a kind of what we call as a spillover effect. The second one, of course, we are talking about the security situations within the ASEAN region itself. Intra-ASEAN dispute, border disputes are still there, and then we are going to move forward in order to, on how to solve these kinds of, uh, let's say, traditional uh, problems. <clears throat> then the next one is situations in the rest of Southeast Asia. And here, I think we have to mention about the uh, conflict in South China Sea and how China is very aggressive on this uh, nine death line, which then become the 10 death line. I think the more has mentioned about this one, and of course, the situations in the wider regions, we have to also to mention about, we have also to take into account the importance of, let's say, the problems in Korean Peninsula uh, and also the uh, Taiwan Strait across relations, especially uh, between US and uh, China on uh, that uh, strait. So the next one, so how can we reconcile and what kind of problem, uh, what kind of, let's say, lesson that we can learn from this previous security concert? I think, there is no other option that we have to try to reconcile security as a relational phenomenon and the need to reconcile traditional and non-traditional uh, concern or issue into the, 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 the capacity of hybrid warfare to some extent. So this, is, this will become then, uh, will uh, make what we, call, uh, what, we call, uh, what we are going to have on the next or the future is about security outlook. So how can we do this? I think, I'm going to propose, let's say, and this is very, very open to debate. Uh, next, please. 
this is the hybrid threats and hybrid warfare. So if we can see from this simple, let's say, picture, but actually this is very complicated anyway, uh, the hybrid threats is very, is very there, the high probability. But the, more, the major theater war or major war, well, it's getting lower. But in the middle, I think we are going to have what we call as hybrid threats and hybrid warfare. So that is the reason, I think, the significance of the first ASEAN solidarity, solidarity exercise, a joint military exercise among ASEAN members, I think two months ago in Batam, is very, very uh, crucial or, or even very essential. So I think ASEAN should move uh, forward, starting to, uh, to work on the non traditional security issue. And I would like to underline what uh, Ibu Emilia has mentioned. Then we talk, uh, this is about the snowball effect. We start with the national uh, non-traditional security issues, and then we can move uh, further on. So this is, I think, the options that we can have uh, considering the very complexities uh, of situations in uh, our regions. So uh, the next one, and this is again another model that probably we can adopt or we can adjust. This is about the uh, what we call as an integrated regional approach. We have to be able to, let's say, to assess the problems first. And this is about hybrid threat because it is a combination between political, military, economic, social, and so on and so forth. And then the role of civilian SMEs subject uh, matter experts like Center for South uh, East Asian Studies is very important in order to have, I do again uh, agree with Ibu Emilia, to have not only first track, but also one and a half or even the second track. So this is what we call as a very integrated uh, regional uh, approach in order to deal with our very complicated security problems. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, model, I think, that we can uh, discuss uh, later on. The next one is, OK, this is the uh, ASEAN and Euro-Pacific. And uh, I'm very happy that Professor Taylor has also mentioned about AYP, and I think we can uh, further discuss about the importance of AYP as, let's say, a bridge, a builder between the uh, major uh, power states and among us. So uh, I would like to uh, conclude my uh, short presentations. Next slide, please. So I think it is more than necessary for us for further widen, again, widen and deepen the security cooperations not only talking about uh, traditional safety issues, but the more important one, I think, the combinations between traditional and non-traditional, and this is what we call as a hybrid uh, approach, a regional, uh, a more integrated regional approach. Then we need to further consider, consider an integrated regional approach for ASEAN in dealing with hybrid threats and future regional security challenges. And something that we have uh, discussed a bit earlier, I think it is also very important for us, and I think this is quite essential uh, to uh, talk about regional rule-based order in order to become the common platform for us to enhance the, pro the prospect for closer city cooperations, not only within the ASEAN, but also with the major powers. So thank you very much and hope that it will be very useful for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Anak Agung. Uh, you have given a very good, excellent speech. I agree, fully agree with you. The regional rules-based uh, uh, system must be very essential for ASEAN security to deal with security issues. You have also touched about regional security and uh, traditional security and non-security issues and also hybrid threats also. It is very, very interesting. So now we have a third speaker from Taiwan, Dr. Ting Hui Lin is the Deputy Secretary, Taiwan Society of International Law. Dr. Lin is also an adjacent uh, assistant professor, Department of Maritime Police, Central Poli uh, Police University in Taiwan. Dr. Lin received his PhD in political science from National Taiwan University and his BA and MA in diplomacy from National Changchi University. Dr. Ting Hui Lin is the former vice president of the Prospect uh, Foundation and vice president of Taiwan Brain Trust and adjacent assistant professor at Central Police University and Taiwan Police College. From 2003 to 2008, Dr. Lin is the assistant researcher in Taiwan's National Security Council. When he served in the gov government, he focused on 
Pacific Islands countries, East China Sea and South China Sea issues and established some research programs and proposed the first and second Taiwan Pacific Alliance Al Allies Summit in 2006 and 2007, drafted a Sprotly Initiative in 2008. From 2011 to 2012, he is the postdoctoral fellow in Chapas, Academia Sinica. Dr. Lin teaches on close and co uh, cases of the ITLOS, uh, International Tribun uh, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in Central Police University and Taiwan Police College. His research areas include the East China Sea, South China Sea, and Pacific Islands. So now the floor is yours, Mr. Lin. Uh, please, you have 15 minutes to speak. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be invited here to join the, uh, this conference, and uh, thanks for the uh, Center for Southeast Asia Studies at the uh, TECO. Um, uh, this uh, topic, I think, very uh, important in uh, the region, uh, but especially I want to focus on the uh, uh, Chinese Coast Guard or China Coast Guard, uh, because you can see uh, the development of the uh, maritime security for China, and then uh, if they want to do some uh, something for the law enforcement or uh, uh, protect their sovereignty or sovereign rights, uh, they always use their uh, maritime militia or uh, coast guard to do that. So uh, this is my topic is uh, the Chinese coast guard right now domain the South China Sea or not, or uh, before uh, they use their Navy or use their military activities uh, uh, do, and uh, how to uh, face the Chinese Coast Guard more and more influence or more activities here. So uh, what is the Chinese Coast Guard? You can see before uh, 2018 and and the Chinese Coast Guard is affiliated to the Ministry of Nature and Natural Resources, uh, belongs to the uh, National uh, Ocean Bureaus. But right now, it's uh, uh, the part of the uh, 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 People's uh, Armed Police uh, become the uh, military agent. Uh, they command assistance uh, from the State Council to the uh, Central Military Commissions. So uh, for Taiwan or for the uh, uh, Japanese uh, Coast Guard, uh, we we see our Coast Guard is the police, not the military. And But for the Chinese uh, Coast Guard, they become a, a military agent, not the police, not just the police. Okay, next, next slide. Next slide three, okay. Uh, you can see the second Thomas George event uh, from the early of this year. Uh, because I think this uh, situation is more serious because uh, uh, Americans come back to the Philippines because the uh, new president marks and they invite Americans to uh, deploy the more military bases in the Philippines, especially Palawan. So you can see the, uh, this, this year, uh, especially from uh, uh, January, February, and especially April, uh, the Chinese Coast Guard uh, used their large uh, amount of the Coast Guard to surround it, especially the Second Thomas Shores. Uh, because you can uh, see the map, uh, Chinese occupied Mischief Reef, and the Second Thomas Shores just uh, uh, in the middle of the uh, Mischief Reef and uh, Palawan. And uh, uh, near the uh, Second Thomas Shores is Commander Reef. Commander Reef also have uh, many uh, Chinese Coast Guard around there. And uh, the other the other area is uh, Reef Bank. Reef Bank, uh, above the Reef Bank is uh, Scarberry Shore. So you can see that this line, I can call it this is the Philippines first chain. And uh, uh, if the uh, Chinese, Chinese government, they, Establish the military bases in a mischief reef. It means that uh, the Americans' uh, military base in Palawan will uh, threaten the uh, will threaten the, the Chinese military uh, bases in mischief. So that's why uh, I think uh, Chinese coast will 
uh, do more uh, uh, near uh, Second Hamas Shores or uh, uh, Palawan Island. So this, uh, you can see the Philippines Coast Guard, the, the, the ship is a smaller than the Chinese Coast Guard. And uh, uh, this is the April's event. But uh, the American Defense Secretary Austin said uh, the mutual defense treaties applies to armed attacks on either country's defense assets to include uh, public vessels and public aircraft anywhere in the West uh, Philippine Seas or South China Sea. The name of the Philippines preferred to South China Sea in uh, February uh, 2023 and uh, in May uh, retaliated. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay, this is uh, uh, October uh, 4th and uh, the same as near the Second Thomas Shores, uh, the Chinese Coast Guard uh, bracket the uh, Philippines uh, Coast Guard vessels. Next slide. And this is the warship on the Sex Thomas Shores, uh, Syria Metery. And uh, the Philippines want to uh, give some surprise to the uh, soldiers on this warship, but the Chinese Coast Guard use uh, every kind of the method to stop it. Next week, next slide. And yesterday, uh, this is uh, two events. Uh, ship collisions uh, near the Second Thomas Shore. Uh, this is the Chinese Coast Guard uh, to uh, uh, bumps the Philippines supply boat. Uh, even the supply boat maybe is a severe severe boat, but uh, it's uh, authorized by the Philippines uh, Coast Guard or Navy. So I think it's a uh, uh, public vessel. And uh, if the Chinese Coast Guard Using the uh, any kind of the uh, um, uh, implied activities to uh, bound the Philippines port, I I think it's a uh, very uh, serious uh, situations. Next slide. And this is another event uh, also near the Second Thomas Shores is the uh, Chinese maritime Malaysia vessels and. Uh, uh, bump the uh, Philippines Coast Guard. Uh, I, 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 the same situation, uh, the same event uh, uh, yesterday. Next slide. So how about the Chinese Coast Guard law uh, in 2021 and uh, uh, especially Article 21st? Uh, they said uh, if the foreign warship uh, refused to leave, and uh, cost serious harm or threat the maritime police uh, agency, especially the uh, Chinese Coast Guard, has the right to take measures such as forced evictions and forced towing. Next slide. But UNCLOS Article 95 and Article 196, uh, uh, let's say uh, the, the warship or the navies and have the uh, immunity from the jurisdiction of any state or other the flag state. Uh, and so uh, how about the Philippines public vessels? And how about the Chinese uh, Coast Guard? And uh, they, uh, they, they all worship and they all enjoy the immunities. Uh, how to do uh, and how to face the situations. Next slide. And, uh, you can see the uh, uh, maritime Malaysia. Uh, someone says maritime Malaysia is just a fishery boat, but for me, uh, you can see the based on the law of the People's Republic of China's on national defense, Article Twenty Two, the armed they said the consist of the armed forces of the People's Republic of China are composed of the active and reserved forces of the Chinese People's Liberation Army the Chinese People's Armed Police Forces and the Malaysia. So, of course, Malaysia including maritime Malaysia. Next slide.
So the United States commitment to the Philippines, uh, you can see the uh, Blinken or Austin or the uh, Vice President Harris uh, also said that if the uh, Philippines armed forces or public vessels or aircraft uh, in the Pacific, especially including uh, the South China Sea, uh, if being attacked, uh, well, uh, uh, the Americans will reaffirm and uh, say, well, use the mutual defense treaties, Article 4. Next slide. And not only the Philippines, but also the uh, Vietnam, you can see the Vanga Bank, uh, the Chinese Coast Guard also borrowed the Vietnam's Coast Guard and the Vietnam's uh, some uh, platformed, uh, oil platformed, uh, oil well uh, in the in Vietnam's EEZ. Next slide. Uh, this is a calculation, uh, a statistics about the uh, uh, last year. Uh, and the Chinese Coast Guard, uh, they uh, appear here, uh, just like the uh, uh, Vanguard Bank, uh, 300, uh, 300 days, and the second time shows is the 279 days. Uh, you can see uh, from the uh, 2013, when uh, the Chinese government uh, built the uh, the uh, spreadery and, and uh, they have the uh, bases over there, the Chinese Coast Guard uh, will go uh, uh, the Malaysia or the Philippines or the uh, Vietnam and to borrow other other countries' boat. Next slide. So my conclusion is, uh, uh, if you the low sea said the land dominates the seas, but right now the Chinese uh, Chinese Coast Guards want to dominate the South China Sea, not only the South China Sea, uh, the same as the East China Sea. Uh, you can see the uh, recent event that the uh, the Chinese Coast Guard uh, in the Senkaku Islands territorial sea will ask the Japanese Coast Guard to leave. Uh, in the past. Uh, you can see the Chinese uh, Japanese Coast Guard ask the Chinese Coast Guard to leave, but right now the situation is uh, in the country. And the Chinese, Co Chinese Coast Guard is the military unit, not the public security agents. So uh, not only for the uh, law enforcement, but for the uh, uh, protect their sovereignty or sovereign, sovereign rights, they, they said. Uh, Chinese Coast Guard is implemented implementing effective controls on South China Sea. So you can see uh, uh, last year, they passed the, the Chinese Coast Guard law, and uh, this year they uh, declare the uh, criminal procedures for the uh, Coast Guard. Uh, so uh, law enforcement is, is their, uh, their uh, method to uh, prove the effect controls of their. So uh, the Chinese Coast Guard law authorized this uh, CCC to toy uh, matters, worship matters. So uh, I'm I'm worried about the in the future that like the, the second Thomas Schultz event will more serious in the future. If ASEAN countries uh, try to balance the uh, Chinese Coast Guard activities, so um, you have to develop the Coast Guard capabilities through uh, outside countries' help or support, especially from the United States and Japan. Uh, if the second time sure situation is out of control, what are the countermeasures of the Philippines government? Another legal warfare, um, just like the South China Sea arbitration, uh, military activities with Americans, uh, Japan, and uh, Australia. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know the answers. Maybe uh, Professor Tyler can tell us, but I think this situation is more serious right now. Uh, to Expand the, the enhanced defense cooperation arrangement. Uh, the Philippines may be released more military bases to United uh, uh, United uh, States uh, forces in the future. So uh, it's my observations and the conclusions. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ting Hui Lin. You have given a very excellent present. You talked about uh, second Thomas Shoal, the, which is the now the uh, confrontation between China and the Philippines. Uh, 
actually it is very strange because the second Tamas Shoal is below 200 nautical miles from the Philippine coast, whereas the Chinese coast is 1000 kilometers away. Then also, how come China claims that it belongs to them? It belongs to them. Like in the North Natuna Sea in Indonesia also, they claim their uh, last uh, uh, coast is 1000 kilometer long. They claim our, our land as a, theirs. It is very strange. So that's why uh, now the uh, uh, floor is open to question and answers. Uh, pl please identify yourself. Please raise your hand. Please now. Yeah. Okay. Anybody? Any question? Two, three speakers. Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Here. 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 here, here. Mike. Mike. Thank you. Uh, my name is Syed Hasring, Ambassador of Malaysia to Indonesia. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the floor, but I will limit my question on, uh, on nuclear disarmament. Because um, I think Professor Thayer mentioned something about non-proliferation. Um, there is lack of global consensus on non-proliferation. But you also touched on uh, Sean Fest. Um, I think we need to look at it a bit wider on nuclear disarmament because Sean Fest was established uh, to make sure that Southeast Asia, ASEAN, is free from, God forbid, any nuclear conflict, be it nuclear accidents or nuclear explosions. Um, so I think we need to uh, look at deeper about this uh, on threat of nuclear disarmament in uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's also related to um, what's going on in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but I think we also need to look at what is going on between India and Pakistan, uh, since now we're talking about Indo-Pacific. Um, if there is uh, any accidents between these two nuclear power, then... Uh, the ramification will also be felt in Southeast Asia. So I think for Professor Agung, maybe on this, where do you put um, this aspect of threat in your spectrum of uh, conventional threat and hybrid threat? Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Carl Thayer, yeah, you, are, you can answer. Yeah, thank you. Right. And thank you very much uh, to the ambassador from Malaysia. I was, the uh, way I read my uh, commander's intent for this particular conference was to narrow it to ASEAN and its particular problems. Uh, I'm not trying to elide your question, but the to, to be blunt, my point about the Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty is that China would be two-faced if it signed the protocol. It would be doing that to try to limit the US and other nuclear weapons states, and that's France and uh, uh, the, the UK. Uh, in particular, it will be patrolling with nuclear armed submarines with ballistic missiles in waters that are covered by the geographic scope of Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapons Free Zone Treaty. That's, that was my concern. So there's a little scab being uh, from Australia in that uh, nuclear powered submarines raise issues of concern in the region, uh, and we're definitely not going beyond nuclear power for weapons. No, that's not on the cards. It's still off in the future. And American nuclear powered sub uh, vessels have been traversing uh, the region for a long, long time, and we haven't seen any nuclear accidents of that type arise. Although our cousins in New Zealand still have a ban on the visits by nuclear ships. And then finally, it's just that we want a rules-based order. Who's rules-based? Well, in this case, on the Korean Peninsula, it's the UN and its resolutions. So there should be agreement by the international community that they should be enforced or pressure put on countries like North Korea that evade those sanctions and keep testing ballistic missiles, uh, improving their capability to deliver nuclear weapons 
and I called attention to that. That's not to belittle the India-Pakistan uh, threat, uh, but I was two-tiered thing. One, ASEAN itself, I would, in other words, I'd be saying, don't let one nuclear weapon state sign the protocol until they all can agree or as unsatisfied in that regard. That would be my, my point, because I don't I don't particularly trust the Chinese. And two, the rules-based order, whether well, it's in America or China, no, on the Korean Peninsula, we have a UN endorsement, and there's no higher level than that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Now, Professor Parnap, yeah, you can answer, yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, sir, for your questions. I think you know quite well that there will be uh, a lot of uh, requirement in order to meet uh, so many security challenges in our regions. But uh, allow me to start with the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, requirement that the biggest uh, challenge for us is basically is the to maintain or even to improve the internal uh, cohesion, which is part of the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the biggest challenge for ASEAN. So in order, uh, to let's say to improve the internal cohesion, I think we we need to maintain a very unified uh, position uh, among our members. So that will be, I think, the only options that we can uh, in order, for example, to promote uh, more practical cooperations among ASEAN. So, uh, a more practical cooperations, I think, uh, are very uh, important in order to let's say to deal with the uh, so many complicated. A problems with that and I think that will be a kind of challenge and I think we can see what is going on uh, uh, for us uh, in our uh, next ADM, meet, uh, ADM meeting in, in Jakarta next month and I think you will be there sir. Yeah, <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah okay over there. Please Mike please Mike please. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I, I will have uh, two questions for two speakers. Yeah. The first is for uh, Mr. Uh, or Professor uh, Huilin, um, and also to Professor Banyu uh, Anakumun Perwita. Uh, my name is Emil Radiansa from uh, Paramadina University. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor uh, Huilin, that uh, uh, in your slide, you said you mentioned about uh, if Asian countries try to balance the CCG activities to develop Coast Guard capabilities through outside countries such as uh, United States and Japan uh, for the support. Um, my question is uh, um, into uh, what extent that the effectiveness of the uh, support by the US and also for the, the uh, and Japan or outside uh, um, powers or great powers from uh, outside. Uh, ASEAN countries and um, East Asian countries. Um, uh, as we know that uh, China uh, is not stand back from uh, its position in the South China Sea. So uh, into what extent that um, uh, we need the support of US and uh, uh, Japan support uh, from your uh, slide. Uh, second for uh, Professor Banyu, Ana Agu Banyu Perwita. You mentioned about the further widen and uh, deepen security cooperation uh, between uh, ASEAN. My question is, uh, into what level or into what, uh, into uh, how deepen that uh, the cooperation should be uh, happen uh, between uh, these uh, ASEAN countries? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lin. Please answer, Dr. Lin. Yeah, yours. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your uh, questions. And uh, first thing is, uh, I know the Vietnam or the Philippines uh, have ever asked the Japanese government to help them to um, strengthen their capabilities of the Coast Guard, especially to help them to build the, some uh, some boats or to train uh, some uh, uh, Coast Guard uh, uh, police or uh, in the uh, in Japan or in 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 Japan or in even in Taiwan, we also helped uh, some uh, uh, Coast Guard. And, but I, I, I think is uh, you, you can see the Chinese Coast Guard, uh, the amount larger and larger. But uh, I think the uh, qualities is the problem. I, you can see the, the, their ship 
it's more uh, concrete. Uh, uh, comment rooms is weak. So, but uh, you can see the Chinese, uh, Japanese, uh, very concrete, sorry, but uh, they're, they're both even smaller than the Chinese Coast Guard. But the uh, quality is, is more, uh, more uh, is better. So, Philippines Coast Guard, even in, in photos, in pictures, we can see the one, but uh, uh, you can see the Japanese Coast Guard, their, their boat, their ships. Even the Chinese can uh, uh, well, think more to do further activities to the China Japanese Coast Guard. Why? Because uh, the, uh, the quality is, is good and the quantity is not good for the Chinese. So I just suggest the, the Philippines also, they can, you can uh, learn some more or uh, give, uh, get some support from the Japan or from the United States or if you want to do more help. You, uh, can help the suspension the capabilities of about the Coast Guard. Uh, uh, Navy or warship will not encounter in the South China Sea in the in the South China Sea. This is why the Coast Guard only the queues in the South China Sea, but also the Coast Guard queues in the in the South China Sea. Why? Because you can see the the Coast Guard police. Coast Guard is the military agent. So they use the weapons. So that's why we have to think up more about the any any problem? Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lin. Yeah. yeah. Professor Anak Agum. Yeah. You, you can answer. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh. Thank you for your uh, very interesting questions. Well, basically. Uh, may refer to the process of engaging uh, all the actors, uh, outside actors, and also the uh. The, the, the inside actors. So in that context, what I would like to to uh, to mention is that, or to add you, that uh, we have, uh, in order to deepening or to widening, we we can, for example, uh, use the uh, existing mechanism, and we have AYP already, and I think Professor Taylor has also mentioned about that. And in that context, I think uh, we can use this by uh, deepening and widening the area of cooperation. As you may uh, aware, uh, I think I'm quite sure that you are aware of this. One of the uh, main pil pillars of the AYP is about maritime cooperation. So by, uh, let's say, extending, uh, deepening, and widening the terms maritime cooperation, then I think we can uh, do a lot of things in order to, let's say, to handle with the uh, problems in our uh, maritime security. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the ASEAN solidarity exercise uh, two months ago in uh, Batam Island, I think will be one of the uh, important points, and it can be a kind, uh, it can be, uh, uh, it can become an icon uh, for uh, ASEAN countries to further move beyond uh, within ASEAN countries. So we can start, and, and you know, uh, I think that the ASEAN solidarity exercise uh, among the navy of ASEAN. Uh, start to respond, uh, starting to respond, uh, or start to respond, let's say, the humanitarian uh, uh, assistance and disaster relief. And you know quite well that we have a lot of uh, problems on uh, disaster uh, and humanitarian assistance in that context. So we can start with that kind of things first. So 
uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, this can become a kind of a snowball effects. We can start from the small one, and then it will become a bigger and bigger. And I think that will be it will be up to us. Uh, it will be uh, it will be depend on our strong willingness in order to go further uh, beyond, uh, let's say, uh, the existing mechanisms, and then go beyond to the other possible uh, mechanisms that we can uh, try to uh, find. Uh, in order to uh, respond to the future security challenges. So probably that will be my response to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Yeah. Over there, over there, over there. Okay. Check. Uh, thank you. My name is Afri Smiring from Indonesia Defense University. Uh, we already talking about many uh, challenges, threats, and issues in ASEAN. Also, the we're talking about Indo-Pacific region. And my question is, uh, I was curious about the presence of French military in the Indo-Pacific. France said uh, uh, they're committed to helping maintain peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. And I was curious about uh, will France military presence then enable France intervention in several regions in the Indo-Pacific, including uh, several ASEAN regions? And how will ASEAN respond to this? Is ASEAN ready? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Call Call Tayer, you want to answer? Hello, Professor Carl Thayer, you want to answer? Right, yeah, sorry, the sound seems to have gone down a bit. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, well, one, uh, France is a resident, France is a resident power in the Indian, uh, Indo-Pacific. Yeah. Pacific Islands, they've been there for the longest, and it's probably the law, the largest European force, if you will, uh, in those particular waters, uh, not counting uh, Australia. Uh, they have been uh, a, a, an increasingly constructive player from Europe, where individual countries and the European Council itself have seen and, and the sea lines of communication are vital important to the, to the economic well-being and prosperity of Europe itself. German frigate uh, in the region, the Netherlands and Italy more recently have all sent warships as they're entitled to under international law on the high seas and they've combined uh, in military exercises uh, with the United States and sometimes some regional countries. So I, uh, I, the sound seemed to drop. I, I, whether the question was posed, which I wasn't clear about, uh, definitely one of the French forces is not going to be a threat in Southeast. In the Indian Ocean and in, in the small, uh, uh, the relationship with France. So I see it as one that in times of a rising power like China, uh, the balance of power mechanism is one way of maintaining global order. And what we're, we're seeing is a natural response by countries worried uh, and wanting to keep the US engaged, but also to throw their own weight into the mix. Uh, and also they're vitally concerned that a, a conflict doesn't arise over Taiwan, which would affect their economies in an even worse way. So, uh, and France can't do an awful lot on its own, uh, but if it does it in cooperation as it has been, uh, operations with France, operations with the US and, and, and other friendly countries, uh, that's a counterbalance to China. And from my perspective, I would see it as positive. It's, in, it's being done according to international law and they have every right uh, to freedom of navigation on the high seas. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Anakago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last, the last question from one of the donors. 
one of the students from I, uh, IDU. Yeah. I think I can respond your questions much deeper uh, during the class later on. Okay, no, no, just kidding. Well, <laughs> well, basically, uh, something that I would like to add that uh, if you take a look at the uh, working, uh, the, the agenda of ADMM, ASEAN Defense Minister Meeting, and we have uh, a lot of uh, some working groups and some of working groups uh, uh, work, uh, try to deal with the uh, non-traditional issues like maritime security cooperations, uh, maritime security, and then the, the problems of terrorism, uh, uh, gender and security, and so on and so forth. So I think what I'm going to 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 uh, to say to you is that uh, this is uh, this is a kind of reflection of ASEAN, and including ADMM and ADMM plus, uh, in order to have a non confront non confrontational uh, confrontational approach. So we are going to move forward to uh, emphasize some issues or some agendas of security that we can work on together. So I think this is a kind of, let's say, uh, uh, an advanced uh, uh, steps yeah, or efforts from ASEAN, ADMM, in order to try to deal with so many complicated issues uh, on, on, on our regions. So uh, more response I will give you in the class later on. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think this is the end of our session. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Carl Thayer. And uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Ting Hu Lin and Dr. Professor Anaka Gum. Thank you very much. Uh, now I hand over the mic to the MC, Mr. Jihan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Perawala Anjaya, for a very delightful dis discussion. Your Excellencies, Ambassador, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, now we come to the end of the event of International Seminar Contemporary Issues in ASEAN Post-ASEAN Summit 2023. On behalf of the organizer, we would like to extend our deepest uh, appreciation and thankful for your valuable participation. We wish all of us stay healthy and see you in our next event. Thank you.